in turn. For each case study, we will identify the findings that we regard as being open on the evidence, and we will invite the entity involved in the case study to respond in written submissions. We will also identify more general questions that arise in relation to these topics, and all parties with leave to appear in the hearings will be invited to provide written submissions addressing those general questions. The first topic that was considered in these hearings was agricultural finance. The first case study concerned ANZ and its handling of former customers of landmark financial services following ANZ's acquisition of Landmark's loan and deposit books in March 2010. The Commission heard evidence from Mr Benjamin Steinberg, ANZ's Head of Lending Services, Corporate and Commercial. It also heard evidence from Mr Michael Hurst. Over the course of three days, Mr Steinberg gave evidence about 13 farmers or farming families who were former customers of Landmark Financial Services. They were the Cheesemans, the Courts, the Hursts, the Harleys, the Handleys, the Cashmores, the Falots, and six other farmers or farming families whose names are the subject of non-publication directions. Mr Steinberg also gave evidence about ANZ's acquisition of Landmark more generally and about changes in the practices, policies and culture of ANZ's lending services team over the past eight years. In relation to many of the cases about which he gave evidence, Mr Steinberg acknowledged that ANZ had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations, and in some instances, that ANZ had engaged in misconduct. In relation to all of the cases about which he gave evidence, Mr Steinberg acknowledged acknowledged that there were things that ANZ would do differently if a similar situation arose today. ANZ's board decided to acquire the loan and deposit books of Landmark Financial Services on the 21st of October 2009. Part of the rationale for the acquisition was to give ANZ the opportunity to enhance its agribusiness portfolio and become the second largest agribusiness bank. Another part of the rationale was to enable ANZ to cross-sell its products to landmark customers. ANZ also identified an opportunity to reprice the loans of landmark customers to earn an additional $6 million in annual revenue. Mr Steinberg was not able to say whether ANZ took advantage of that opportunity. ANZ undertook a due diligence process in connection with the acquisition among other things, that process identified that the Landmark loan book was of a lower quality than ANZ's loan book and that Landmark's management had underestimated the provision that would need to be made for the losses it would incur on its loan book. ANZ was aware that there were issues in relation to the Landmark loan book, including a poor control environment within Landmark and a lack of regulatory oversight of Landmark. ANZ acquired the Landmark Loan Book on the 1st of March 2010. From that time, the former customers of Landmark were customers of ANZ. Mr Steinberg acknowledged that ANZ could have done a better job in communicating with the former Landmark customers about the acquisition. Over the following year, ANZ migrated the former Landmark customers onto its systems. Mr Steinberg acknowledged that there were issues associated with this process which affected former Landmark customers. Mr Steinberg accepted that the quality of the Landmark loan book was worse than ANZ had anticipated. In March 2010, there were 433 former Landmark accounts with an internal risk rating of 7 plus D or worse with a total value of $273 million. By July 2013, there were 1,050 former Landmark accounts with the same internal risk rating or worse, with a total value of $722 million, which was around a third of the total value of the former Landmark loan book. In the years that followed the acquisition, ANZ received complaints about its handling of the accounts of former Landmark customers. 
as we have mentioned, Mr Steinberg's evidence concerned ANZ's handling of the accounts of 13 farmers or farming families who were former customers. The cross-examination of Mr Steinberg focused on two families in particular, the Cheesemans and the Harleys. The evidence in respect of the Cheesemans and the Harleys was lengthy and complex. Rather than summarising that evidence in this closing address, we have prepared a separate document that does so, which we will tender. That document has a doc ID of RCD 9999061001. What should I call it, Ms Orr? We uh, have called it, Commissioner, Summary of Certain Evidence in ANZ Landmark Case Study. Document with that title, RCD 9999061001, can be marked as Exhibit 4.218. Mr Steinberg told the Commission about changes that it had made to lending services since 2014. In August 2014, ANZ established a specialist agribusiness team within lending services. It established this team because it was thought that high-risk agribusiness customers would benefit from being serviced by relationship managers with specific knowledge of and experience in agriculture and restructuring. At around the same time, ANZ started to use farm debt mediation more frequently and increased the frequency of face-to-face -face farm visits by lending services staff. In the first half of 2015, after stories about former Landmark customers began to receive both political and media attention, ANZ made further changes to the culture of lending services. In July 2015, after a story about Mr Falot was broadcast on 60 Minutes, ANZ established a task force to review the files of former Landmark customers. The task force went on to review the files of about 200 former Landmark customers. Mr Steinberg estimated that ANZ reached settlements with about 40 or 50 of those customers for a total amount of around $40 million. ANZ continued to make changes in 2016 and 2017. It is now a requirement for members of the Lending Services Global Leadership Team to approve any decision to commence enforcement action. Where enforcement action is taken, ANZ now has a panel of insolvency providers who have signed up to a consistent set of terms and conditions. ANZ expects that in the conduct of their duties, these providers will act consistently with ANZ's values. Further, where evaluation is obtained, ANZ now gives the customer input into the choice of valuer and as a matter of policy provides a copy of the valuation to the customer. Decisions in lending services at ANZ are now informed by the lending services purpose. Mr Steinberg explained that the lending services uh, team try to make the purpose an integral part of their culture and the way they act and behave on a day-to-day -day basis. Among other things, the lending services purpose emphasises that ANZ should take into account the emotional and personal impacts of recovery and enforcement action on customers in its decision-making processes. Mr Steinberg said that a question he now often puts to his people in the lending services team is, is this the right thing to do? We turn to the findings that we submit may be open to you, Commissioner, on the evidence. We begin with the available findings in relation to ANZ's communications regarding its acquisition of Landmark's loan and deposit books and the transition of former Landmark customers to ANZ systems. First, Mr Steinberg acknowledged that ANZ's communication with former Landmark customers at the time of and immediately following the acquisition of the Landmark loan book was not always satisfactory. Mr Steinberg acknowledged that this conduct fell below community standards and expectations and it is open to the Commissioner to, find a fi to make a finding consistent with that acknowledgement. Second, Mr Steinberg also acknowledged that there were issues associated with the transition of former Landmark customers to ANZ systems. 
He acknowledged that some former landmark customers experienced delays in receiving responses from ANZ to information and funding requests following the acquisition. He said that there were also cases where limits were incorrectly loaded on the new system and interest rates were incorrectly charged and that some customers experienced difficulties in opening accounts. Mr Steinberg acknowledged that this conduct fell below community standards and expectations and it is open to the Commissioner to make that finding consistent with that acknowledgement. We turn to the available findings in relation to the Cheesemans. First, ANZ entered into an asset management agreement with the Cheesemans under which, among other things, ANZ gave the Cheesemans less than two months to sell their properties and ANZ required the Cheesemans to give vacant possession of their properties within seven days of ANZ's demand if those properties did not sell at auction. It is open to the Commissioner to find that this conduct fell below community standards and expectations. Second, ANZ repeatedly refused the Cheesemans' request to delay the sale of the properties on which they lived to see if they could repay their debt without losing their homes. In circumstances where the Cheesemans had told ANZ that they would have nowhere to live if the homes were sold, and there was a real prospect that the exclusion of the homes from the auction would make no difference to the sale price. It is open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ's conduct in refusing to exclude the homes from the auction fell below community standards and expectations. Third, after the Cheesemans had sold nearly all of their properties, ANZ repeatedly refused to accept offers made by the Cheesemans to settle their outstanding debt. Mr Steinberg accepted that ANZ rejected those offers because it thought that it could obtain more money if it relied on its security interests. Mr Steinberg acknowledged that three of the settlement offers made by the Cheesemans in June, October and December 2012 were reasonable. ANZ declined each of these offers and Mr Steinberg accepted that each time it did so, it put the Cheesemans at risk of losing their remaining property where Reuben and Katrina Cheeseman lived. Mr Steinberg accepted that by refusing to accept these offers, ANZ had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations and it is open to the Commissioner to make a finding consistent with that acknowledgement. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that by refusing to accept the Cheesemans' reasonable settlement offers, ANZ may have engaged in misconduct by breaching its obligation under Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice, which required ANZ to act fairly and reasonably towards the Cheesemans in a consistent and ethical manner. We turn next to the available findings in relation to customers who were the subject of Annexure B to Mr Steinberg's statements. Just it before we uh, go on to that, can I just go back one stage with, uh, by reference to the Cheesemans? Um, yes, Commissioner. With, with a view to uh, inviting those who are going to make submissions about these matters, obviously immediately ANZ, but I suspect more broadly. Uh, the acknowledgements that Mr Steinberg made about uh, want of compliance with community standards and expectations uh, seemed to me, uh, subject to what I'm later told, to be unpacked as uh, it wasn't fair to act in the particular respect. Now, if that's the right way to unpack that idea, and ANZ will no doubt tell me what they want to tell me about that, then at once you go to identifying, well, what's the connection, if any, between that idea and what you see in the Code of Banking practice about fairly reasonably consistent ethical manner. And I'll be assisted, I think, uh, if uh, 
both in relation to the particular cases, but more generally, some attention is given to the connection between fairness as a community standard, to which I would have ordinarily thought the other uh, limb was honesty. So community expects uh, entities to act fairly and honestly. Connect that with code of banking practice, fairly reasonably consistent ethical manner, although differently expressed, I rather suspect its content is not materially different. And then uh, it may or may not be relevant to go on and observe that uh, both Corporations Act 912A and uh, the uh, Credit Act uh, general conduct provisions talk of efficient, honest, fair. Now, leave aside questions of efficiency for the moment. Honesty and fairness are lying at the core of those matters. That's a very long interruption. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Orr, but uh, uh, it occurs to me that uh, I will be assisted if parties do give some thought to that and uh, see whether the unpacking I've flagged uh, is right or wrong. Yes. I was turning, Commissioner, to the available findings in relation to the customers who are the subject of Annexure B to Mr Steinberg's statements, whose names are the subject of a non-publication direction. First, uh, Mr Steinberg told the Commission about an occasion in October 2011 when ANZ met with these customers to discuss their debt reduction options, but on the same day issued them with a default notice. Mr Steinberg accepted that this do did not represent consistent communication with the customers. He described the file as one that was difficult and had a long history and accepted that this suggested that there was greater reason for ANZ to be consistent and reasonable in its dealings with these customers. In these circumstances, it's open to the Commissioner to find that by behaving in this inconsistent way, ANZ may have engaged in misconduct by breaching its obligation under Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice. Alternatively, it's open to the Commissioner to find that this conduct fell below community standards and expectations. Second, Mr Steinberg told the Commission about an occasion in January 2012 when ANZ refused to accept an offer by the customers to settle their outstanding debt to ANZ. In refusing this offer, ANZ did not explain the reasons for its refusal or invite the customers to enter into further negotiations. This occurred in circumstances where the offer made by the customers was equal to the fair market value of the real property held as security by ANZ. In these circumstances, it's open to the Commissioner to find that by failing to explain the reasons for refusing the settlement offer, ANZ may have engaged in misconduct by breaching its obligation under Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice. Again, alternatively, it's open to the Commissioner to find that this conduct fell below community standards and expectations. We turn next to the available findings in relation to the hearse. First, Mr Steinberg acknowledged that having regard to the cumulative effect of a number of different aspects of ANZ's conduct towards the hearse between 2011 and 2013, that conduct fell below community standards and expectations. The conduct included not engaging in farm debt mediation with the hearse, entering into a deed of settlement and release that involved little or no compromise from the bank, and increasing the interest rate on the hearse facilities at a time when they were known by ANZ to be under financial stress. Consistently with Mr Steinberg's acknowledgement, it is open to the Commissioner to find that this conduct fell below community standards and expectations. Second, Mr Steinberg accepted that at one point in time, he had formed the view that ANZ had acted in breach of Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice in relation to the hearse. 
by encouraging and granting increased loans to the hearse without either informing them that it disapproved of their property investment model or obtaining updated valuations. By the time he gave oral evidence before the Commission, Mr Steinberg had changed his mind about this. However, he accepted that this conduct formed part of ANZ's conduct in relation to the hearse that fell below community standards and expectations. It is open to the Commissioner to find that by encouraging and granting increased loans to the hearse, ANZ may have engaged in misconduct by breaching its obligation under Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice. Alternatively, consistently with Mr Steinberg's acknowledgement, it is open to find that the conduct fell below community standards and expectations. We turn next to the available findings in relation to the Harleys. First, in September 2013, ANZ entered into a settlement <coughs> deed with the Harleys. By the time the Harleys entered into that deed, they had made attempts to sell their assets to repay the debt, including putting their flock of sheep and all of their properties up for auction. They were also dealing with the ill health of Mr Harley, who had suffered a heart attack earlier that year. Under the deed, the Harleys were required to repay their debt in full within six months. If they did not, they were required to give ANZ vacant possession of the properties within one day and ANZ was entitled to obtain immediate judgment against them in the Supreme Court of Western Australia. In the circumstances, it is open to the Commissioner to find that by entering into a deed in these terms, providing for immediate enforcement action if the Harleys did not repay their debt by the deadline, ANZ may have engaged in misconduct by breaching its obligation under Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice. Alternatively, this may be characterised as conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. Second, in March 2014, after the Harleys had sold five of their nine parcels of land, including the parcels that they thought would be most difficult to sell, and paid down $1.6 million of their $2.5 million debt, they asked ANZ for an extension of time from March 2014 to December 2014 to sell their remaining properties so that they could sell them in the spring when, the interest, in, when interest in the properties was likely to be higher. Despite the fact that the Harleys had demonstrated their willingness to sell the properties and had had some success in selling those properties, in April 2014, ANZ refused the request for an extension and appointed agents for a mortgagee in possession. Mr Steinberg said that he did not know whether there was any reason for ANZ to think that agents for a mortgagee in possession could get a better price for the sale of the remaining parcels of land than the Harleys could. Rather, the bank took enforcement action in the interests of certainty and the properties were sold before spring at a substantial discount to the June 2013 valuations. Mr Steinberg accepted that if the same situation arose today, he would have been more likely to give the Harleys some additional time to sell their properties. In those circumstances, it's open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ's conduct in refusing the extension and taking enforcement action fell below community standards and expectations and potentially breach Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice. Again, arising out of that and, and related issues, uh, it's not immediately apparent to me that there is any timing issue. Uh, let me explain that a little. Uh, <coughs> If Mr Steinberg would treat things differently today, uh, why should things not have been treated in that same way uh, yesterday uh, at the time of the events? Uh, it occurs to me that someone may uh, wish to say, oh, times have moved on, times have changed, <coughs> standards have somehow changed. 
Well, if someone's going to say that, uh, I will be much assisted by knowing uh, why and how. Um, if we're dealing in concepts like fairness, uh, it's not instantly apparent to me that what is fair today uh, is different from what was fair yesterday. So um, if somebody wants to make a timing point about this, uh, it is not likely to be persuasive if they just say times have changed. They might have to unpack that quite a bit. Yes. Now the third available finding in relation to the Harleys relates to conduct in uh, December 2014 when the Harleys lawyers asked ANZ to release the Harleys from their obligation to pay the outstanding debt, which by that time was around $309,000. By this time, ANZ had required the Harleys to sell all of their properties, including their home, at a time when Mr Harley was recovering from serious health issues. ANZ had charged the Harleys almost $60,000 in enforcement costs and left them without their farming business, which was their method of generating income. It had also sold the last four of the Harleys' properties at a substantial discount to their June 2013 valuations and had sold them before spring, when the Harleys had told the bank there'd be the most interest in their properties. In those circumstances, it's open to the Commissioner to find that by refusing the Harleys' request, ANZ may have engaged in misconduct by breaching its obligation under Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice. Alternatively, it's open to characterise this as conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. We turn to the available findings in relation to the Handleys. First, Mr Steinberg told the Commission about an occasion in November 2014 when the Handleys lawyers asked ANZ to postpone a mediation on the basis that Mrs Handley had received adverse test results arising from a series of biopsies. ANZ refused this request without seeking more information, even though Mrs Handley had in fact been diagnosed with cancer and was scheduled for surgery. Mr Steinberg accepted that this conduct fell below community standards and expectations, and it's open to the Commissioner to make a finding consistent with that acknowledgement. Second, Mr Steinberg told the Commission that ANZ made a series of errors in relation to the overcharging of interest and fees in relation to the Handleys' accounts. As a result of those errors, there was a period when the Handleys did not have access to funds and several of the cheques that they presented were dishonoured. Mr Steinberg accepted this, that this conduct fell below community standards and expectations and it's open to the Commissioner to make a finding consistent with that acknowledgement. Third, Mr Steinberg told the Commission that ANZ had also failed to extend overdraft limits to the Handleys in circumstances where it had agreed to extend those limits, which meant that there was a period when the Handleys were charged default interest when they should not have been. Mr Steinberg did not accept that this conduct fell below community standards and expectations, but it is open to the Commissioner to find that it did. Fourth, Mr Steinberg told the Commission that there was an occasion where an ANZ staff member involved with the Handleys signed documents as a witness, even though the staff member had not witnessed the Handleys signing the documents. Mr Steinberg accepted that this amounted to misconduct and it is open to the Commissioner to make a finding consistent with that acknowledgement. We turn next to the available findings in relation to the customers who were the subject of an extra G to Mr Steinberg's statements, whose names are also the subject of a non-publication direction. Mr Steinberg told the Commission that in May 2010, ANZ offered those customers a $450,000 overdraft facility, 
but only made a $350,000 overdraft facility available to them. It wasn't until September 2010 that ANZ made the full facility available. Mr Steinberg accepted that this conduct fell below community standards and expectations and it's open to the Commissioner to make a finding consistent with that acknowledgement. We turn to the available findings in relation to the for lots. First, Mr Steinberg acknowledged that ANZ breached clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice in its dealings with the for lots. He accepted that ANZ took responsibility for some of the dealings that Landmark had with Mr Falot Jr in relation to the original lending to him and he accepted that after ANZ acquired the Landmark loan book it failed to work constructively with Mr Falot Jr to overcome his financial difficulties. Mr Steinberg conceded that the bank had acted in a way that was not fair, not reasonable and not ethical. Consistently with these acknowledgements, it's open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ engaged in misconduct by breaching its obligation under Clause 2.2 of the Code in relation to the Falots. Second, Mr Steinberg acknowledged that ANZ had breached Clause 25.2 of the Code of Banking Practice in its dealings with the Falots. ANZ failed to try to help Mr Falot Jr to overcome his financial difficulties and instead issued a notice terminating the facilities and requesting repayment of the facilities. Consistently with this acknowledgement, it's open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ engaged in misconduct by breaching its obligation under Clause 25.2. Finally, I turn to the available findings in relation to the other customers referred to in Mr Steinberg's statement, whose names are, with one exception, subject to non-publication directions. First, in relation to the customer in the second row of the table in paragraph 43 of Mr Steinberg's statement, Mr Steinberg acknowledged that ANZ had engaged in poor communication and inconsistent practice in that it had applied the entirety of the secured property sale proceeds to reduce principal rather than annual principal and interest payments. Second, in relation to the customers in the fourth row of the table in paragraph 43 of Mr Steinberg's statement, Mr Steinberg acknowledged that it, ANZ had failed to honour cheques, contrary to a previous commitment to do so. Third, in relation to the customers in the fifth row of the table in paragraph 43 of Mr Steinberg's statement, Mr Steinberg acknowledged that it had engaged in poor communication with these customers in relation to the restructure of the customers' loans. Mr Steinberg acknowledged that in each of these instances, ANZ's conduct fell below community standards and expectations. Consistently with that acknowledgement, it is open to the Commissioner to find that in each of those instances, it did so fall below community standards and expectations. Fourth, in relation to the customer in the first row of the table in paragraph 45 of Mr Steinberg's statement, Cashmore Farms Proprietary Limited, Mr Steinberg acknowledged that ANZ made significant variations to the Cashmore's loan which was not in monetary default, without also communicating those changes in a clear and transparent way, and that it applied the sale proceeds of a residential property to a long-term loan rather than a short-term loan. Fifth, in relation to the customers in the third row of the table in paragraph 45 of Mr Steinberg's statement, Mr Steinberg acknowledged that ANZ took guarantees from the customer's mother and siblings without taking all reasonable steps to ascertain if they were suitable to act as guarantors. Mr Steinberg acknowledged that in both of these instances, ANZ had breached its obligation under Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice. Consistently with that acknowledgement, it's open to the Commissioner to make such a finding. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ's misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations can be attributed to ANZ's lack of preparation 
for a situation that would require it to deal with significant numbers of agribusiness customers experiencing financial difficulties. Mr Steinberg accepted that the landmark loan book was of a lower quality than ANZ's loan book and that ANZ was aware at the time of the acquisition that there were issues in relation to the loan book. However, Mr Steinberg said that the documents that he had seen concerning ANZ's preparation for dealing with the impending financial difficulty that former landmark customers would encounter had all centred around calculating the overall dollar provision. ANZ did not calculate the number of incoming customers who were going to experience financial difficulty and it relied on its usual processes and procedures to manage those accounts. It did not establish a specialist agribusiness team within lending services at the time of the acquisition. At this time there was a lack of training of lending services staff about how to have difficult conversations with distressed customers. Although ANZ intended to retain about 80% of the former landmark financial services staff, 10% of those staff departed in the first six months and more departed after that. When those staff left, that led to a loss of established relationships between landmark staff and their customers and a loss of corporate memory of the former landmark customers' files. This lack of preparation for dealing with agribusiness customers in financial distress was exacerbated by the fact that ANZ underestimated the number of former landmark customers who would experience financial difficulties. As we've already mentioned, Mr Steinberg accepted that the quality of the landmark loan book was worse than ANZ anticipated. Um, this may be attributable to ANZ's failure to conduct proper due diligence in relation to the landmark loan book and its reliance on assumptions. In October 2016, ANZ's board considered a report of the finding of the task force's review of the files of former landmark customers. The board minutes record that there is a lesson to be learned from the landmark acquisition in connection with the assumptions that were made around delinquencies and expected losses that were not stress tested. Mr Steinberg said that he was not aware that the expected losses were ever stress tested. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that the misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations can be attributed to the culture of lending services in the period before ANZ took steps to change that culture, commencing around August 2014. Before August 2014, there was no specialist agribusiness team within lending services. There were some instances where customers had not seen a bank manager for over two <coughs> years, which Mr Steinberg acknowledged was not <coughs> acceptable. There were also examples of files where customers were refused seasonal funding during planning time or interest payments were due at the wrong time of a farm's working capital cycle, such as before harvest. At this time, lending services relied more on external law firms to deal with customers in financial difficulty. It took a less flexible approach to dealing with these customers and demonstrated a lack of empathy an understanding of fa farmers' emotional connection to their land and the emotional impact that recovery and enforcement action can have on agribusiness customers. At times, lending services increased the interest rates of customers experiencing financial difficulty, placing an additional financial burden on the customers. As we've mentioned, since August 2014, ANZ has made a number of changes to the culture, governance and policy of lending services. Perhaps the most important of those changes was the introduction of the lending services purpose, which now guides decision making in lending services at ANZ. In a report by the General Manager of Regional Business Banking, 
and the General Manager of Lending Services to ANZ's board in October 2016, these changes in the culture, governance and policy of lending services were said to ensure that there would be no repetition of the issues identified with ANZ's handling of former landmark customers. ANZ is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we've identified as open to the Commissioner, as well as any other findings that it regards as open on the evidence. All parties with leave to appear will be permitted to provide written submissions addressing the following questions. First, what does it mean for a bank to act fairly and reasonably towards a customer in a consistent and ethical manner? What does that obligation require of a bank in relation to agribusiness customers in an enforcement context? Second, what weight should a bank give to the interests of the customer when making decisions about agribusiness customers experiencing financial difficulty? How should a bank balance the competing interests of the customer and the bank in that context? Third, in what circumstances is it both best for the customer and best for the bank to appoint an external administrator? As to that second question and competing interests, uh, it would be of assistance if parties addressing uh, that question identified with some care and precision what exactly are uh, the interests that are in competition. At least at one level uh, an available view may be that the minimising of loss to the bank uh, will minimise loss to the customer and to that extent the interests of both parties uh, are parallel rather than competing. Uh, to approach it only in that way uh, may perhaps, I don't say it does, obscure uh, issues about increased cost of capital and the like uh, that arise in connection with uh, non-performing loans. But uh, be that as it may, uh, generalised references to competing interests uh, are likely to be less helpful uh, than more particular uh, and uh, specific identification uh, of the interests that are in competition uh, and require resolution according to the party submitting uh, one way rather than the other. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Uh, we turn to the second case study examined in these hearings, which concerned Rabobank and its dealings with Wendy and Adrian Brower. The Commission heard evidence from Mrs Wendy Brower and from Mr Bradley James, the regional manager for an area that included the Browers' farm. The Browers farm cattle and grow hay from Kaiora, a property located around 280 kilometres southwest of Rockhampton in central Queensland. They acquired their farming business from Mr Brower's parents in 2002. The Browers became customers of Rabobank in 2005. Initially, they took out a single facility for $700,000, which represented a refinance of their existing facilities, together with additional working capital to rebuild their cattle yards. The facility had a 15-year term. Later in 2005, the Browers took out a second facility with a $200,000 limit. That facility also had a 15-year term. In 2006, the limit of the first facility was increased to $800,000 and in 2008, it was increased to $1 million. In March 2009, the Browers temporarily relocated to the United States. They purchased a home there sold all of their cattle and leased out Kaiora to another farming family. In June 2009, the Brower's bank manager, who had been their manager since they became clients of Rabobank, 
emailed them in the United States and advised that a property about 80 kilometres from Kaiora, known as Jamburu, was on the market. The email named the vendor, gave the location of the property, an estimate of the number of breeders that could be run on the property, and gave an estimate of the sale price, which was said to be around the $4 million mark, possibly less. At the time the Browers received that email, they were not actively looking for another property. However, they discussed the proposal and Mr Brower, in particular, was interested. Mrs Brower responded to the bank manager's email and sought additional information. The manager sent a further email in which he told the Browers about another family that was interested in purchasing a portion of Jamburu and gave the Browers information about the potential price of Jamburu. Later, in July 2009, the bank manager conducted a valuation of the portion of Jamburu that he had identified for the Browers and valued that portion at $2.9 million. He also conducted a valuation of the portion of Jamburu that the other potential purchasers were interested in and valued that portion at $1.1 million. This brought the total valuation of Jamburu to the same figure he had identified for the Browers in his earlier email. Rabobank's valuation policy at that time permitted all valuations for non-residential security properties to be conducted internally by bankers. No specific training in valuations was provided. In 2009, APRA required Rabobank to review its rural valuation policy and had required Rabobank to clarify and tighten its requirements for internal valuations. This led to Rabobank engaging Ernst & Young to conduct a targeted review of Rabobank's collateral and foreclosure management. That review suggested that improvements should be made to the extent to which collateral management systems and processes at Rabobank were not independent of the business origination <coughs> function. In a letter from APRA to Rabobank in December 2011, APRA noted Ernst & Young's finding that in the majority of cases at Rabobank, the loan originator valued the secured property, leading to a risk that collateral may be overvalued by the loan originator either deliberately or in error. However, Rabobank did not move to a model that separated loan origination from collateral valuation until after the European Central Bank released draft regulations requiring valuations of secured property to be independent from the client and from the commercial department that maintained the relationship with the client. <coughs> it did that by establishing an asset quality management department with responsibility for valuations and removing the ability of loan originators to conduct valuations. Returning to the Browers, in the period between the bank manager's valuation of the property and the preparation of his written appraisal, the bank manager and Mrs Brower exchanged further emails. In Ju July 2009, the bank manager emailed the Browers and outlined how a possible purchase of part of Jamburu could be financed. Amongst other things, the manager explained that the Browers' existing facility limits were 1.2 million, not all of which was fully drawn. He suggested an additional three million be borrowed, uh, which would increase the Browers' total borrowings to 4.2 million. The Browers understood this to mean that undrawn, fee, undrawn funds would remain in the facility following the purchase of Jamburu. They had planned to utilise those undrawn funds, along with funds held in farm management deposits and realised equity on the sale of their home in America, in order to stock Kaiora and Jamburu on their return to Australia. Mr Brower travelled to Australia to inspect Jamburu with the bank manager. Mr Brower had lengthy discussions with the bank manager in which he expressed concern about the short-term financial difficulties they may face on return to Australia when their lease income from Kaiora would reduce and there would be no income from cattle sales. The bank manager replied that undrawn funds could be drawn down at that time. 
In September 2009, the bank manager prepared and submitted to Rabobank's credit department a credit submission. The credit submission proposed additional lending of $3 million, taking the Brower's total facility limits to $4.2 million. It also included historical information about the Brower's business and projections about what the business would require and what the cash flow would be like in future years. The credit submission noted that the Browers facilities were well managed with no history of excesses or temporary limit increases. It also noted that Kyora was currently leased and would continue to be leased until March 2011, after which the current lessee would lease half of the property while the Browers progressively restocked the other half. It noted that Jamboree would be leased back to the current owner at an agreed rate of $175,000 per annum. On the 17th of September 2009, a representative from Rabobank's credit department emailed the bank manager and expressed multiple concerns with the credit submission, including that the proposed gearing was high and serviceability was hard to get a hold on. The credit, uh, the credit department uh, representative said that from that point until 2012, the request did not work and most of 2013 is hypothetical. He said that the assumptions within the credit submission about cattle numbers and cattle prices were either wrong or debatable and he said that living expenses had not been properly accounted for. The representative from the credit department also raised a number of questions about the Brower's investment properties, the substitution of adjustment income if the vendor of Jamboree was to move off the property and the Brower's current income and expenses. On the same day, the bank manager emailed the Brower's. The email presented an optimistic view about the prospect of credit approval. The manager wrote that Sydney have come back to me with a few questions, mainly to do with the rental properties and to your living expenses whilst overseas. Mr James agreed that the bank manager's email to the Browers did not explain the credit department's most significant concerns about the credit submission. Mr James also agreed that the Browers should have been, <coughs> but were not, told of the credit department's concerns about the viability of the proposal. After obtaining a response from Mrs Brower to the questions in his email and corresponding further with the credit department, the bank manager again emailed the Browers on the 22nd of September. That email explained that after some back and forth with Sydney, it would appear that we will get approval. In this email, the bank manager then outlined a proposed funding arrangement with facility limits of $3.9 million rather than the $4.2 million that had been discussed to that point. Under the proposed arrangement, a $3.7 million facility would be put in place in replacement for the existing $1 million facility and the existing $200,000 facility would be continued. The bank manager told the Browers that in March 2011, when the lease of Kyora expired, the bank would provide a loan increase for livestock purchases. Based on the communications with their bank manager, the Browers understood that funds would be made available to them upon their return to Australia in order to restock Kyora and to stock Jamboree. Mr James accepted that the Browers were entitled to understand the statements from the bank manager as a commitment on the part of Rabobank to fund cattle purchases on the Browers' return to Australia. The funding proposal was put to the Browers by way of a formal letter of offer in January 2010. The Browers accepted that offer and proceeded with the purchase of Jamboree. Unbeknown to the Browers, the vendor of Jamboree was also a client of the bank manager, as were the parents of one of the purchasers of the other portion of Jamboree. The bank manager did not at that time act for the purchasers of the other portion of Jamboree, but was encouraging them to become, to become clients of Rabobank. The failure to disclose this information to the Browers was a breach of Rabobank's internal policies, 
which required that appropriate disclosures be made in circumstances where the bank is acting on more than one side of the transaction. The settlement of Jamboree did not occur for many months. In order for the sale to complete, the Browers had to contribute around $60,000 as there was insufficient credit available in the new Rabobank facility to meet the purchase price and expenses associated with the acquisition. Rabobank did not undertake a further assessment of the Brower's financial position in the time between the bank manager's September 2009 communications and the formal offer of funding in Jan January 2010, nor between January 2010 and the settlement of the property in August 2010. In December 2010 and January 2011, significant flooding occurred in parts of central Queensland, including at Kaiora. That flooding destroyed the hay crop of the lessee of Kaiora. The lessee elected not to renew the lease for a further two-year period, which was contrary to the Browers' expectations. That decision placed considerable financial pressure on the Browers. They notified the bank manager of the lessee's decision almost immediately after being told of that decision. In March 2011, the Browers returned to Australia and to Kaiora. They had anticipated receiving rental for half of Kaiora at that stage. Following their return to Australia, the Browers inquired about borrowing a further 300,000 from Rabobank to restock Kaiora. They were introduced by the bank manager to another Rabobank employee, Mr Brady, who was to be their new bank manager. Mr Brady responded that a further 300,000 could be advanced, but on the condition that the sum of $3 million be repaid within two years by June 2013. Mrs Brower said that she felt they had no choice but to accept the offer given their dire need for additional finance at that time. In June 2011, the Australian government's ban on the live export of cattle to Indonesia came into effect. This had the effect of depressing cattle prices and generally making trading conditions more difficult. Mrs Brower's evidence was that she inquired as to hardship arrangements with Mr Brady, but was told that no such arrangements were available. The Browers were unable to repay the $3 million by the 30th of June 2013. At the Browers' request, Rabobank provided a further 12 months for that sum to be paid. The Browers were still unable to repay the $3 million by the 30th of June 2014. From the 1st of July 2014, default interest of 4% above the standard rate was applied to the Browers' facilities. In January 2015, Rabobank invited the Browers to attend farm debt mediation. Before the mediation, the Browers engaged a legal aid solicitor. Their solicitor requested that Rabobank provide him with certain documents so that he could properly prepare for the mediation, <coughs> and he asked some questions about Rabobank's conduct. Rabobank declined to provide the documents, uh, or to answer the questions set out in the email. The mediation was a stressful experience for the Browers. By the end of the mediation, an agreement was struck by which the Browers would sell Jamboree for not less than $2 million on or before December 2015. The Browers would refinance the remaining balance of their facilities with Rabobank by June 2016 and Rabobank would rebate the default interest that had been charged, which was by that time $115,490. The Browers later sold Jamboree for $2.4 million and refinanced the balance of their facilities through a private lender under a short-term high interest loan. Mrs Brower estimated that as a consequence of the Jamboree purchase and subsequent sale, the Brower family had lost at least $1 million. In his draft statement initially provided to the Commission, Mr James did not consider that Rabobank had engaged in any misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations. Further, 
he maintained that Rabobank would deal with the situation involving the Browers in the same way under its existing policies. Mr James later revised those views. In the final version of his first statement, Mr James accepted that the contents of the email sent by the bank manager on the 22nd of September 2009 could have caused the Browers to consider that they had an assurance from Rabobank that further funds would be provided in March 2011 for livestock purchases. He accepted that the terms on which the $300,000 was provided to the Browers in August 2011 did not meet an expectation on the part of the Browers that may have been created by that email and therefore this conduct fell below community standards and expectations. <coughs> he also accepted that this conduct may also have constituted misconduct in that it may have breached the code of banking practice because it was unfair to the Browers. In a supplementary statement provided prior to giving his evidence, Mr James uh, made some further acknowledgements. He accepted that the conduct of Rabobank in approving the proposed facility without communicating to the Browers that it could not be serviced if they ran both properties at full capacity fell below community standards and expectations. He accepted that this conduct could be characterised also as a breach of the code of banking practice in that it was unfair to the Browers. He accepted that Rabobank's refusal to provide the documents sought by the Browers, <coughs> as well as the information sought by the Browers prior to the farm debt mediation, also fell below community standards and expectations. And he accepted that this conduct could be characterised as misconduct within the meaning of the Banking Code of Practice. In the course of his oral evidence, Mr James also conceded that Rabobank had failed to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in selecting and applying its credit assessment methods and in forming its opinion about the Browers' ability to repay the $3.7 million loan and had therefore breached Clause 21 of the Code of Banking Practice. It is open to the Commissioner to find that Rabobank's conduct amounted to misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations in each of the ways acknowledged by Mr James. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that by acting on each side of the Jamboree transaction without disclosing that fact to the Browers, Rabobank failed to act in an ethical manner as required by Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice and therefore engaged in misconduct. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that by failing to inform the Browers of its policy on hardship in circumstances where the Browers' operations had been adversely affected by both flood and the live export ban, Rabobank engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. It is open to the Commissioner to find that the misconduct and conduct that fell below community standards and expectations was a result, at least in part, of the remuneration policies and practices of Rabobank. Those policies and practices rewarded loan sales and failed to properly weight other important elements of the banking <coughs> relationship, including the accuracy of the assessment of loan serviceability, the accuracy of the assessment of security value, and frankness in communicating credit concerns to clients. Mr James gave evidence that Rabobank's current remuneration structure is still predominantly driven by sales, and is therefore not yet consistent with the recommendations of the Sedgwick Review. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that the misconduct and conduct that fell below community standards and expectations uh, was the result of inadequate internal systems at Rabobank. It remains unclear as to why the loan to the Browers was approved. The initial concerns of Rabobank's credit department were not dealt with in a comprehensive fashion in any document provided to the Commission. 
In no document provided to the Commission did the Credit Department explain that those concerns had been addressed. At all relevant times, Rabobank's policies regarding internal appraisal of property <coughs> values failed to adequately divide the function of loan origination and security valuation. Rabobank placed both tasks in the hands of a banker who was incentivised to write loans and failed to have internal appraisals assessed by staff who were qualified and experienced in that field. All parties with leave to appear are invited to make written submissions on the following questions. Is it appropriate for financial services entities to conduct internal appraisals as opposed to obtaining independent valuations of farms and other rural property? If so, in what circumstances is it appropriate? Is it appropriate for staff involved in origination of the loan to conduct or otherwise be substantively involved with such appraisals? Should there be minimum levels of qualification, skill and experience before a bank employee can be authorised to conduct appraisals? If so, what are the appropriate minimum levels? Should there be a code that sets out the requirements for the conduct of internal appraisals by financial services entities, either in respect of rural properties or more generally? If so, what form should that code take? If it is inappropriate for financial services entities to conduct internal appraisals of property to be taken as security, what should be done to stop or discourage that practice? Are the legislative obligations on financial services entities to provide documents prior to a farm debt mediation, such as the obligation in Section 21 of the Farm Business Debt Mediation Act in Queensland, sufficient? Should they be extended to oblige financial services entities to provide information on request as well as documents? <clears throat> Those are the questions we pose in relation to the Rabobank case study, Commissioner. Yes. The third case study examined in the hearings involved conduct by Bankwest in connection with Mr Melville Ruddy. Mr Ruddy is a 68-year-old cattle farmer from Western Queensland. Mr Ruddy <laughs> gave evidence, as did Ms Sinead Taylor, the Executive General Manager of Personal and Business Banking at Bank West. Mr Ruddy and his wife owned two farms, Sunrise and Aaronfield. Since 2007, they had held loan facilities with Rural Bank. In 2010, a Bank West bank manager began actively courting their business. The Ruddies declined an offer to move to Bank West in 2010 for reasons that included their desire not to pay for external valuations for their properties. By 2011, Mr and Mrs Ruddy were seriously considering selling one of their properties, Sunrise. They were again approached by Bank West. Bank West offered the Ruddies increased loan facilities and more competitive interest rates than those offered by Rural Bank. Ms Taylor gave evidence that Bank West put forward an aggressive price to attract the Ruddies' business. The bank manager that they had been dealing with had also obtained a valuer's ticket and was able to offer the Ruddies free internal valuations. The Ruddies agreed to move from Rural Bank to Bank West. By letters of offer signed in October 2011, the Ruddies took out three separate facilities with Bank West, totalling $1.12 million. The facilities were secured by their two properties. The bank manager, who was by then an accredited valuer for Bank West, appraised both properties, valuing Aaronfield at $1.1 million and Sunrise at $1.2 million. At the time that the bank manager brought the Ruddies to Bank West, the bank manager's key performance indicators were heavily weighted towards profitable growth. In the 2011 financial year, 
the bank manager had achieved 134% of his sales targets and processed in excess of 60 applications, most of which were new to bank clients. He had been named a rural and regional champion by Bank West as a result. In March 2012, the bank manager left the bank. At about that time, Bank West began to uncover significant issues with the conduct of the bank manager, including that he had overstated valuations, engaged in inappropriate and improper mis-selling, and manipulated internal Bank West systems to avoid behavioural triggers. By May 2012, these events had resulted in at least 15 separate complaints about the bank manager and losses to the bank of about $374,000. Ms Taylor accepted that there was no record of the bank manager's customers being informed of this misconduct. Bankwest first became aware of errors specific to the Ruddy's valuations in early May 2012. Ms Taylor accepted that the valuation error should have been picked up long before this time. The errors detected at this time included errors in relation to the date of the valuations, which Ms Taylor was unable to explain. It later became apparent that there were more material errors in the valuation <coughs> of Sunrise. Instead of valuing Sunrise on the basis of it being 72 hectares, as it was, Sunrise had been valued by the bank manager on the basis that it was 896 hectares in size. Throughout 2012 and 2013, the Ruddy's farming operations faced a number of challenges due to Mr Ruddy's ill health, the live cattle export ban, low cattle prices and drought. Bankwest continued to extend credit to the Ruddy's throughout this period. In about May 2013, Bankwest informed the Ruddies that it wanted to revalue their properties and that the Ruddies would be required to pay for those revaluations. Prior to receiving the valuations, Bankwest also issued two letters of offer to the Ruddies, which extended their facilities. The May 2013 revaluations were completed by an external firm using the correct inputs. Aaron Field was revalued at 900,000, down from the previous $1.1 million valuation, and Sunrise was revalued at 750,000, down from the previous $1.2 million valuation. Bankwest informed Mr Ruddy that as a result of the revised valuations, the Ruddies were in breach of their loan to value ratio and they would have to sell Sunrise. Around this time, Bankwest issued further letters of offer reflecting those arrangements. The Ruddies were charged $6,600 to their overdraft accounts for the cost of the valuations. They were not given notice that those amounts would be charged. As a result of paying for the valuations, Mr Ruddy was not able to afford feed for his cattle and over the next few months he lost 80 head of cattle. The Ruddies subsequently lodged a dispute with the Financial Ombudsman Service. FOS determined that the internal valuation in 2011 had been flawed and that Bankwest should not have relied on the 2013 revaluations to require the Ruddies to make a principal reduction to reduce debt and to sell the properties. However, the Ruddies did not accept the Ombudsman's recommendation or determination. They subsequently participated in a farm debt mediation and ultimately settled with Bankwest on the basis that they would sell Sunrise within six months <coughs> and pay Bankwest 75% of the net sale proceeds. They also agreed to pay Bankwest an additional $410,000 to discharge the mortgage over Aaronfield. Mr Ruddy said that he felt that this was his only choice. Ms Taylor gave evidence that Bankwest would not deal with the Ruddy's matter in the same way today because Bankwest has introduced increased controls in respect of internal valuations. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Bankwest may have engaged in misconduct 
by breaching the obligation in Clause 2.2 of the Code of Banking Practice to act fairly and reasonably towards the Ruddies in a consistent and ethical manner. The conduct that may have breached Clause 2.2 is as follows. <coughs> First, offering the loan facilities to the Ruddies on the basis of an incorrect valuation. Ms Taylor accepted that by getting the valuation wrong, Bank West had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations, but she did not concede that it was misconduct. Second... That's a good example of uh, the need to unpack uh, what is seen as being community standards and expectations and what that requires uh, and how, if at all, that differs from the obligation to be fair. Yes. Uh, the second uh, potential breach of clause point two arises from the failure to take adequate steps to inquire into the bank manager's valuations of the Ruddy's properties after Bank West learned of the bank manager's misconduct, including his misconduct in artificially inflating valuations. Third... Um, well, again, that's a, a, a point of... Yes, it arises particularly in this case, but it may be a point of general application in the sense that uh, if a, an entity becomes aware of something having gone awry in a particular file uh, and identifies that uh, that has formed part of a uh, series of actions uh, of like kind, uh, what should the entity do? Should it go back and look at uh, the earlier uh, or other uh, files in which the particular manager or operator, whoever it is, uh, has been engaged to see whether there has been like conduct uh, in respect of other files that have not yet uh, come to the surface through complaint or otherwise. Yes? The third way in which Bankwest's conduct may have breached clause point two um, is the reliance on the loan-to-value ratio breach occasioned by the 2013 revaluations to renegotiate the terms of the Ruddies agreement in a way that was disadvantageous to the Ruddies. Ms Taylor accepted that it was not fair for Bankwest to rely on the revised 2013 valuations to trigger a non-monetary default and that this behaviour breached Clause 2.2 of the Code. Fourth, um, choosing not to inform the Ruddies and the bank manager's other clients of the bank manager's misconduct after it had been detected. Ms Taylor accepted that all of the customers should have been told that there was an issue and that the failure to inform the bank manager's clients of the issue was a breach of Clause 2.2. And the fifth way in which the conduct of Bank West may have breached Clause 2.2 of the Code was the failure to inform the Ruddies that it would charge the fees of the 2013 valuations to their overdraft account prior to doing so. Again, Ms Taylor conceded that this was conduct that fell below community standards and expectations, but did not concede that it was misconduct. On the evidence, it's also open to the Commissioner to find that Bank West may have engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations in the following ways. First, Bank West failed to take adequate care in preparing the original internal valuation of Sunrise in October 2011. Second, Bank West failed to have adequate systems in place to detect that the internal valuation was incorrect. Third, Bankwest's processes were lax in several significant respects, as demonstrated by the misdated valuations, the undated guarantees, and separately the guarantees that were signed before the letters of offer. Ms Taylor was unable to explain why the valuation reports completed in 2011 were signed in late 2012 long after the bank manager had left Bankwest. Fourth, when formulating its strategy for dealing with the Ruddies after the receipt of the May 2013 valuations, Bankwest determined that the appropriate course 
was to declare the May 2013 letters of offer null and void, forbear the Ruddy's loan to value ratio breach and issue new letters of variation. In issuing the new letters of variation, Bank West appears to have been motivated by a concern to increase the Ruddy's overdraft sufficiently so that Bank West could charge the external valuation fees to the account. Fifth, as Ms Taylor accepted, Bank West did not deal with FOS in a full and frank way in relation to the Ruddy's dispute. Sixth, the guarantee provided by the Ruddy's son changed multiple times during the life of the facility. Ms Taylor characterised the changes as being troubling and accepted that there was no explanation as to why the guarantee wasn't maintained with the facilities. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that there were a number of causes of the misconduct which are attributable to Bank West's culture and governance practices, as well as to its remuneration practices and to inadequate internal systems. First, it's open to the Commissioner to find that a significant cause of the misconduct was Bank West's remuneration and incentive scheme. The evidence establishes that at the time Bank West offered the facilities to the Ruddies, 60% of its KPIs for employees <coughs> like the bank manager were weighted towards profitable growth. Half of that was allocated to asset sales targets. Provided that employees met a risk gate opener, they could then be eligible for short-term incentive payments. The evidence established that in the 2011 financial year, Bankwest employees were able to double their base salary through such bonus arrangements. This created a culture of prioritising sales to the detriment of diligent and prudent conduct in relation to loan approvals. The Ruddy's <laughs> bank manager received his base salary and was eligible for a short-term incentive of up to 57% of his salary by way of additional bonus. Second, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Bank West did not have in place adequate internal systems to minimise the risk of conflict of interest posed by internal valuations. The only cross-check done on internal valuations in 2011 was for the internal valuation to be provided to the credit team with the credit submission. At that time, the credit officer was required to validate the valuation prior to approving the deal. This was not an adequate mechanism to address the inherent risk of conflict of interest posed by internal valuations. Bankwest continues to permit internal valuations by its sales professionals and applies growth-focused key performance indicators to those employees. Bankwest does not consider that this places th such sales professionals in a conflict of interest as long as the valuations are checked by another employee. But the review that takes place is solely a review on the papers. Bank West is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we've identified as open. All parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following questions. First, do remuneration and incentive policies that reward bank employees for the volume of loans sold create an unacceptable risk that bank employees will prioritise the sale of loan products over the bank's responsible lending obligations, over the bank's statutory obligations, including to provide loans in a manner that is efficient, fair and honest, and to have in place adequate arrangements to ensure that customers are not disadvantaged by any conflict of interest that may arise in relation to the provision of loans, and over the bank's obligations to act fairly and reasonably towards customers in a consistent and ethical manner. The second set of questions that arises from this case study relates to internal valuations, <coughs> and we have already outlined those questions in connection with the Rabobank case study. I was going to turn after that, Commissioner, to the fourth case study involving the Smiths, but perhaps that is a convenient time. Are we travelling, Miss? 
I think it, I think it would be useful, Commissioner, if we had a 45-minute uh, lunch and adjournment rather than an hour. So if I come back, what, at uh, 10 to 2? Yes, or? thank you, Commissioner. Right. 10 to 2 it is. Yes, Ms. Orr. Commissioner, the fourth case study examined in these hearings involved conduct by NAB in connection with Deborah and Kenneth Smith. The Commission heard evidence from Deborah Smith and from Ross McNaughton, the General Manager of Strategic Business Services at NAB. The Smiths are also Queensland cattle farmers. They own two properties, Oakvale, a breeder property outside of Pentland in the Charters Towers region of Queensland, and Libri, a fattening property outside of Hewenden in the Flinders Shire. The two properties are about 140 kilometres apart. The Smiths became customers of NAB in March 2008 and took out two facilities, a business markets loan with a limit of $3.1 million and an overdraft of $250,000. Mrs Smith gave evidence about the impact of the live cattle export ban on their business including the dramatic decline in the price that they could obtain for their cattle and the increases to the costs of many of the inputs to their business. Mrs Smith said that the effects of the ban were felt for some time. In 2012, the Cape River, which runs through Oakvale, flooded. The flood destroyed fences on Oakvale and damaged the dirt road by which the property was accessed. By August 2012, the Smiths were in financial difficulty. Their banker at NAB completed a referral form for categorisation, the first step in having the file managed by NAB's asset management group, known as Strategic Business Services. The form recorded that the Smiths had been unable to get cattle to market due to wet weather conditions, had been extremely unlucky and had missed an interest payment. Strategic Business Services declined to assume the conduct of the Smiths' file at this point. <coughs> Notwithstanding that their financial difficulties were assessed as being temporary and caused by a natural disaster, the Smiths were not informed of NAB's <coughs> hardship policy or offered any hardship relief at the time. Mr McNaughton agreed that it would be fair to let customers know of the fact of the hardship policy while maintaining that the Smiths' file warranted consideration for hardship relief. By the 1st of November 2012, the Smiths' overdraft account was overdrawn and NAB commenced charging default interest on the account. On the 5th of November 2012, a NAB banker completed a second referral form for categorisation. The banker recommended that the Smiths be retained. Mr McNaughton explained that this indicated that the banker believed that the Smiths could be financially rehabilitated. The Smiths' file was accepted by Strategic Business Services at this time. In early 2013, drought was declared in the Flinders Shire. The Smiths began reducing the number of cattle on Limbury and transferring cattle to Oakvale. The expiry date of the Smiths' business markets loan was the 28th of February 2013. NAB granted the Smiths a one-month extension. At the end of the extension period, the business markets loan facility expired and NAB commenced charging default interest on the amount outstanding under the loan. Notwithstanding that Limbury was officially in drought at that stage, NAB did not notify the Smiths of its hardship policy or offer any relief under that policy. In April 2013, NAB wrote to the Smiths. NAB noted that their facilities had fallen into arrears expressed concern about the viability of their business and advised that it was considering commencing recovery action, which could include possible sale of the Smiths' farming property. NAB invited the Smiths to attend farm debt mediation. Mrs Smith said that on receiving this letter, she and her husband were very frightened. She said that neither Limbury nor Oakvale was saleable at that point in time due to the dry conditions. 
A farm debt mediation took place in Townsville in September 2013. The Smiths attended along with their solicitor from Legal Aid and their rural financial counsellor. Mrs Smith described the mediation as very intimidating. The mediation resulted in NAB and the Smiths entering into a deed of forbearance. The deed imposed various obligations on the Smiths and NAB. In particular, NAB was to allow the Smiths access to funds so that they could continue to tend to their cattle and meet their expenses. The Smiths were to list either Oakvale or Limbury for sale by the 1st of March 2014. Uh, have exchanged a contract for sale by the 31st of May 2015 and have sold one of the properties, I'm sorry, I think I said 2015, 2014, and have sold one of the properties by the 30th of June 2014. The Smiths were also obliged to remit $200,000 to NAB, which they were to gain by cattle sales by the 30th of April 2014. Uh, pay a further $200,000 by the 30th of May 2014, $400,000 by the 30th of June 2014. And if the Smiths complied with their obligations under the deed, NAB was to rebate $50,000 of the default interest charged to the Smiths' accounts. Mrs Smith said that the repayments required by cattle sales would only have been possible if they had had a super year. The Smiths listed Limbury for sale with a real estate agent. Mrs Smith said that the agent advised that it was highly unlikely that a purchaser would be found because of the dry conditions. In April 2014, Mr Smith was hit by a cow while loading cattle into a truck to send them for sale. He suffered broken ribs, a punctured lung and spent two weeks in hospital. Throughout 2014, Limbury remained in drought. The Smiths did not find a purchaser for the property in the time required by the deed, nor were they able to make the repayments required. Oakvale was also dry and was officially drought declared in 2015. In December 2014, the Smiths' relationship manager changed, but the file continued to be supervised by the same person within Strategic Business Services. Mrs Smith said that she was unaware of this fact and has not spoken with the new relationship manager. The Smiths' financial counsellor wrote to NAB and sought an extension of time for them to complete their obligations under the deed. The letter explained that neither Limbury nor Oakvale, Oakvale could be sold to their best advantage due to the drought. It explained the poor state of the cattle market at the time and the low prices obtained by the Smiths in their most recent sales and that the Smiths were endeavouring to refinance their NAB facilities. NAB declined to grant the extension and reserved its rights. Mrs Smith said that both Limbury and Oakvale remained in drought from 2015. Mr McNaughton conceded that NAB could have potentially done more in its communications with the Smiths after the farm debt mediation to ensure that they were conscious of the practical consequences of continuing to be in default. He characterised the Smiths file as a particularly difficult one, even by SBS. NAB has not taken any step to enforce its securities over either Oakvale or Limbury, but default interest has continued to accrue on both facilities. As a result, the Smiths facilities have incurred in excess of $2.6 million in default interest, in addition to ordinary interest charge on the accounts. Mr McNaughton said in his oral evidence that he understood that NAB would hold additional capital as a consequence of an impaired loan, but was una unable to answer whether there was any relationship between the bank's cost of capital and the charging of default interest. He explained that it was customary in Australia for banks to charge default interest as an incentive to comply with the terms of the loan. Mr McNaughton agreed that farmers in drought situations are under heightened level of stress, agreed that the imposition of default interest on farmers in such situations could add to their stress agreed that as events transpired, it was impossible for the Smiths to comply with their obligations under the deed of forbearance, 
and agreed that had the bank enforced at any point, it would not have been able to realise the asset. It's open to the Commissioner to find that by charging default interest to the Smiths for in excess of five years on one facility and in excess of six years on the other, in circumstances where the Smiths' business was affected by more than one natural disaster, NAB engaged in conduct falling below the standards and expectations of the community. It's also open to the Commissioner to find that by failing to notify the Smiths of the bank's hardship policy in August 2012, <coughs> when the Smiths' business had suffered as a result of flooding at Oakvale, NAB engaged in conduct falling below community standards and expectations. In the light of Mr McNaughton's evidence as to the purpose for which default interest is charged, it is open to the Commissioner to conclude that NAB's conduct in charging default interest to the Smiths over such a long period was the product of a culture by which default interest was used as a strategic tool to place pressure on borrowers in default. That such a culture exists is reinforced by Mr McNaughton's evidence that he would expect default interest to be waived at a future farm debt mediation and that his experience has been that all or a large element of default interest is waived by that process. However, the application of default interest in the lead up to such a mediation only serves to weaken the position of the farmers participating in those mediations and lessen their bargaining position. All parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions on the following questions arising from this case study. To what extent does default interest reflect the cost to financial services entities of carrying impaired loans? Should there be a moratorium on the charging of default interest in respect of farm debts secured by farm debt mortgages during periods when the farm property is affected by natural disaster? If so, how should such a moratorium be implemented? By legislation, by an industry code or by some other means? In what circumstances should the moratorium come into effect? In what circumstances should the moratorium be, limit, be lifted? Similarly, should there be a moratorium on the taking of enforcement action in respect of farm property while that property is or soon after that property has been affected by natural disaster? If so, how should such a moratorium be implemented? In what circumstances should it come into effect? and in what circumstances should it be lifted? Should provision be made in the Farm Debt Mediation Acts or another legislative instrument or binding code to facilitate earlier discussion between financial services entities, farmers and third parties such as rural financial councillors in cases where farmers face actual or probable financial distress? Should there be a uniform Farm Debt Mediation Act? If so, is any of the current acts in a suitable form for uniform adoption? The fifth case study examined in these hearings related to loans made by Rural Bank to Queensland cattle industry farmers that became non-performing over the past 10 years. The Commission heard evidence from Alexandra Gartman, the Chief Executive <coughs> Officer and Managing Director of Rural Bank Limited. In December 1998, Bendigo and Adelaide Bank established Rural Bank, then known as Elders Rural Bank, as a joint venture with Elders. In May 2009, Bendigo Bank acquired a controlling interest in Rural Bank. In late 2010, Rural Bank became a wholly owned subsidiary of Bendigo Bank. Bendigo Bank's engagement with agricultural clients is substantially achieved through Rural Bank, which describes itself as a dedicated agribusiness bank. 
In its submission to the Commission on the 29th of January 2018, Bendigo Bank told the Commission that a number of loans taken out by customers in the Queensland cattle industry had become non-performing. Bendigo Bank told the Commission that contributing factors included weak underwriting and an over-reliance on security values, compounded by the live cattle export ban, falling cattle prices, a prolonged and severe drought and a fall in property values. In a further letter to the Commission on the 18th of May 2018 from Mike Hurst, then the Managing Director of Bendigo Bank, Bendigo Bank told the Commission that a number of factors had contributed to these loans becoming non-performing, including an over-reliance on security values and a failure to appropriately establish loan serviceability. Mr Hurst also said that loan performance was exacerbated by inadequate loan management with evidence of a lack, up, a lack of follow-up <laughs> of excesses, arrears and out-of-order accounts, failures to conduct timely reviews or collect updated farm performance information, failures to otherwise detect signs of financial distress at an appropriately early point in time and failures in relation to enforcement processes. Mr Hurst also referred to a failure to make appropriate inquiries and verification of valuations and appraisals, including failures to ensure valuation accuracy, independence and integrity, and failures to physically visit and inspect livestock and properties. In her oral evidence, Ms Gartman told the Commission that she disagreed with Mr Hurst's assessment in a number of respects. Ms Gartman told the Commission of 62 loans that Rural Bank had made to Queensland cattle producers that became non-performing between the 1st of January 2008 and the 31st of December 2017. In her statement, Ms Gartman referred to a number of external events in Queensland, including the live export ban, Yazi-related flooding and severe drought, uh, which she said created the perfect storm scenario for Queensland cattle farmers. Ms Gartman said that whilst those external factors contributed to the 62 loans becoming non-performing, the conduct of Rural Bank had also contributed. She said that there were issues internal to Rural Bank that related to poor judgments in the exercise of discretion, inadequate management oversight, inadequacies in staff training, insufficient performance management of individuals and matters of sales and credit culture, governance framework, approval process and portfolio management. In her statement, by way of explanation as to how Rural Bank discovered these issues, Ms Gartman exhibited a number of reports. These included a report prepared by KPMG, dated the 27th of September 2010, entitled Assistance with Rural Bank's Limited Credit Risk Internal Control Program. This report set out KPMG's findings following a sample review of 10 rural bank client files across five district banking managers. KPMG identified a number of major themes from the review, including suppression of information pertinent to the credit, misrepresentation of data in rural bank systems, which was described as going beyond window dressing of credit submissions, reasons for excesses provided by district banking managers in the seasonal or overdraft accounts not reflecting the actual cause of excesses of customers' accounts, instances of livestock appraisal values appearing to have been inflated to improve the security position of the exposures, deteriorating features not being reported to Rural Bank in a timely manner, non-compliance with condition precedents, including confirmation that tax liabilities were up to date and in order, uh, and failures to follow up on loan conditions and inadequate financial and cash flow analysis. Ms Gartman accepted that the KPMG report returned a number of very concerning findings. Ms Gartman also exhibited a report presented at a board credit committee meeting on the 27th of July 2011 by Mr Tasso Carolis, the general manager of Risk, entitled Credit Structure and Portfolio Trends and dated the 18th of May 2011. 
In his report, Mr Carolus undertook a detailed analysis of a number of aspects of rural banks' lending portfolio. He found that a number of the issues identified by KPMG were clearly systemic and not isolated. He also found that these issues were a significantly material contributor to the credit issues that were then being faced by the bank. In her oral evidence, Ms Gartman told the Commission that she disagreed with the severity with which Mr Carolus painted the picture in his report and that she believed that the findings in his report were overstated. Ms Gartman also exhibited a report by HSW Partners entitled Credit Framework and Operations Review, dated November 2011, which was presented by Mr Graham Willis of HSW Partners at a board meeting of Rural Bank in December 2011. This was referred to by Ms Gartman as the Willis Report. Ms Gartman told the Commission that based on the findings in these reports, and especially the Willis Report, Rural Bank had made a number of significant changes to its processes and procedures, including rebalancing its focus on loan serviceability, improving staff training, tightening performance management, making changes in relation to valuations and appraisals, and implementing new governance practices. In the course of Ms Gartman's evidence, the Commission also heard that APRA had highlighted issues with Rural Bank's approach to loan serviceability as early as 2006 and 2009. In 2009, APRA had noted that a high proportion of Rural Bank loan proposals were being approved despite the failure of policy tests. APRA raised concerns as well about the appropriateness of Rural Bank's credit risk rating system. Ms Gartman recognised that Rural Bank did have an over-reliance on security in Queensland and that the emphasis and the balance between serviceability and security was not appropriate. Ms Gartman also gave evidence about Rural Bank's approach to its customers once their files were transferred to asset management. Ms Gartman said that once customers were brought within Rural Bank's asset management unit, Rural Bank worked with the customer to identify a strategy that would help to address some of the financial challenges they're facing and that Rural Bank would always look to try and trade out of challenges. Rural Bank was not a signatory to the code of banking practice when the misconduct occurred. The Commission heard that Rural Bank became a subscriber to the code in December last year and that Rural Bank had not subscribed to previous iterations of the code. Nevertheless, the code was a professional standard and a recognised and widely adopted benchmark for conduct throughout the period. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Rural Bank may have engaged in misconduct in a number of ways. First, Rural Bank may have breached the obligation to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in selecting and applying credit assessment methods and informing opinions about customers' ability to repay. It's open to find that Rural Bank may have breached this obligation in a number of ways. First, as KPMG found, Rural Bank staff had engaged in a number of breaches of lending standards in relation to serviceability, including a failure to properly assess serviceability and by suppressing information pertinent to credit and by misrepresenting data into the Rural Bank systems. Second, the five district banking managers referred to in the KPMG report had engaged in a significant number of different types of breaches in respect of loan origination. In respect of the file of the Queensland farmer who was ap whose application was approved in circumstances where it was known that $1 million had been provided by his aunt that was sourced from a margin loan that created further liabilities, <coughs> the district banking manager had misrepresented the bank's position to the borrower, had acted dishonestly both towards the bank and towards the customer, and this had led to a loan being originated in circumstances where Rural Bank lacked material information about whether the debt could be repaid. In respect of a Victorian farmer with a livestock mortgage, 
Rural Bank had loaned this customer more than the value of his security and the district banking manager responsible for the in initial valuation should not have increased the customer's facility in circumstances where the customer had been experiencing significant financial difficulty and there were reasons to, direct the to doubt the correctness of the valuation upon which the increase was based. The second way in which it's open to find that Rural Bank may have engaged in misconduct relates to a potential breach of the obligations under the Code of Banking Practice to act fairly and reasonably towards its customers in a consistent and ethical manner. It's open to find that Rural Bank may have breached this obligation in a number of ways as well. First, Rural Bank failed to act fairly and reasonably towards a number of its customers whose loans were not adequately managed. Second, as KPMG found, Rural Bank advanced credit to individuals and entities without undertaking a proper serviceability assessment. It was not fair to do this because this placed those individuals in a position that where they were unlikely to be able to fulfil their obligations under the loan. And third, after identifying customers who had been affected by internal issues within Rural Bank, including the misconduct of the district banking managers, Rural Bank failed to communicate with those customers about those internal issues, which was not fair or reasonable. On the evidence, it's also open to the Commissioner to find that Rural Bank engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. First, the conduct, policies and procedures of Rural Bank materially contributed to the 62 loans becoming non-performing. In her statement, Ms Gartman accepted that five aspects of Rural Bank's conduct, which contributed to the issues relating to securities and valuations, loan serviceability and loan management, fell below community standards and expectations. Second, from recommendations made by APRA, Rural Bank should have been on notice from at least 2009, if not from 2006, of potential systemic issues within its loan serviceability policies and practices. Rural Bank failed to adequately engage with these warning signals to recognise the issues as systemic and to take prompt steps to fix the issues. Third, in 2010, a decision was made to give priority to generating new business and additional lending to existing clients over no increase annual reviews. This was not fair and reasonable to existing rural bank clients who were entitled to expect standard and careful loan management. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that any such misconduct can be attributed to rural <coughs> bank's culture and governance practices, to its remuneration practices and to inadequate internal systems. First, it's open to the Commissioner to accept the findings of the Corollis Report, which include a finding that Rural Bank had a culture of prioritising <coughs> asset growth over careful loan origination and loan management processes. Second, as acknowledged by Rural Bank, it's open to the Commissioner to find that the conduct of Rural Bank that contributed to the 62 loans becoming non-performing included the culture and governance issues to which we've previously referred, being poor judgments in the exercise of discretions, inadequate management oversight of the manner in which the discretions were being exercised, inadequacies in staff training, insufficient performance management and matters of sales and credit culture, governance framework, approval process and portfolio management. Rural Bank is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we've identified as open and all parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following questions. How should banks balance the competing interests of strengthening the long-term relationships with their customers and being prepared to act decisively where necessary, particularly to safeguard shareholder interests? Commissioner will recall that that was the language of Rural Bank's um, mission statement in its Asset Management Unit policy. 
How should banks balance portfolio growth against the need to monitor and manage their existing clients? Do banks have appropriate policies in place for dealing with external events that may impact an agribusiness loan portfolio? If not, what should those policies entail? And should banks be required to conduct, I'm sorry, to contact individual customers when they become aware of misconduct in relation to their accounts? Well, those two last questions, external events and contact with customers, raise their own sets of issues. The first two questions, the ones I want to direct attention to. When we go to the Code of Banking Practice, we observe uh, at the moment the provisions of Clause 27 uh, imposing the, uh, or requiring the exercise of care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in connection with prov provision of credit. In the course of dealing with the first two questions you have identified, it would seem to me uh, that there may be utility in, the, in, in those making submissions considering whether shareholders, customers, the public more generally would expect banks to abide by a standard described as the standard of a diligent, the standard of uh, care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker. Not only in deciding whether to provide credit, which is now dealt with by the Code of Banking Practice, but is it the same standard or a different standard that applies? in deciding whether to vary the terms of credit, as for example, reprice uh, or alter the terms? Is it the same standard or a different standard that should apply in deciding whether, when and how to enforce the credit contract? Three questions, whether, when and how, call for distinct and different uh, consideration. You may or may not get to the same answer in respect of each of them, I don't know. But uh, whether to enforce, when you enforce, and not least how you enforce, seem to me to raise uh, considerations that may require separate examination. Yes, Ms. Orr. Commissioner, the final uh, agricultural finance case study concerned the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. And on Monday of this week, <coughs> two statements of Joanna White, CBA's Managing Director, Corporate and Commercial Banking, were tendered into evidence. And those statements addressed CBA's failure to apply fee waivers and ongoing package benefits to eligible Agri-Advantage Plus package customers. We have prepared a separate, a separate document uh, that sets out uh, our summary of the evidence in relation to that matter and the available findings of misconduct uh, and our... Um, uh, our position on the causes of that misconduct. Um, I want to tender that separate document, Commissioner. I'm sorry that I don't have the document ID to hand, but we will have it before the end of the closing submissions. And what's it to be called, Ms Orr? It's to be called... Submissions of Council Assisting in relation to the CBA Processing Errors Case Study. That uh, document uh, will become Exhibit 4.219.
Now, Commissioner, in the second week of this hearing block, our focus moved to the interactions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in regional and remote communities with financial services entities, including banks, insurers and superannuation funds. As you heard in our opening address in relation to this topic, we consulted with a large number of bodies that provide assistance to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in their dealings with or disputes with financial services entities. As a result of those consultations, we sent out a large number of notices to produce to a large number of entities. We also requested a number of witness statements that have not been the subject of case studies presented in this round of public hearings. This is not because those witness statements failed to identify issues of significance to our inquiry, uh, nor is it because those statements failed to reveal any potential misconduct or conduct falling short of community standards and expectations. Rather, it is because we considered it important to use these <coughs> public hearings to focus upon case studies which, to the extent possible, best demonstrated the complex and overlapping difficulties that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living regionally and remotely have when dealing with financial services entities. For that reason, we settled upon the four case studies which have been presented this week. The witness statements that did not form the subject of case studies this week nonetheless significantly informed our thinking and frequently highlighted issues that were similar to those considered in the public hearings. For those reasons, we'll tender four further witness statements that were provided to the Commission. First, we tender the statement of Ms Sean Lewis of CBA, dated the 28th of June 2018, CBA 9000-0078-0001. Document will be Exhibit 4.220. Ms Lewis's statement addresses the particular detriment suffered by an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander woman who lives in Broome in Western Australia as a result of her difficulties with cancelling a direct debit arrangement in respect of a no interest loan to purchase white goods. Second, we tend to the statement of Mr Robert Musgrove of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank dated the 14th of June 2018. BAB 9000 0001 0001. Exhibit 4.221. Mr Musgrove's statement also addresses detriment relating to direct debit arrangements in respect of an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander woman who lives near Cairns in Queensland. As we explained in the course of our opening address, uh, this consumer was repeatedly charged overdrawn fees of $21.50 and dishonour fees of $40 by Bendigo Bank. Third, we tendered the statement of Mr Anthony Hampton of the Traditional Credit Union, dated the 19th of June 2018, TCU 0003-001-001. Will be exhibit 4.222. Now, this statement provides important context as to the high cost of TCU's fees and charges. As we explained in our opening address, TCU's business model is fundamentally different from that of other ADIs because TCU relies on fee income rather than interest income. TCU's fee structure provides insight into the cost of banking in remote communities throughout the Northern Territory. Fourth, we tender a statement of Gavin Teichner, T-E-I-C-H-N-E-R, from TAL, dated the 22nd of June 2018, WIT 0001-0070-0001. Exhibit 4.223. Mr Teichner's statement provides helpful context in relation to the funeral insurance operations of a major player in the Australian market. Commissioner, in the course of the evidence given by Ms Edwards and Mr Boyle on Tuesday morning, 
and in the evidence of Mr Bowden yesterday, the Commission heard about a number of difficulties faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people when seeking access to their superannuation entitlements. These difficulties included, but were not limited to, a lack of understanding of the existence or purpose of superannuation, identification issues, difficulties associated with meeting the conditions of early release of superannuation, and difficulties associated with the release of death benefits. Given that superannuation will be the subject of the Commission's next round of hearings, we will further consider these topics at this point. In the course of that round of hearings, we will invite responses to questions relating to the interaction between superannuation funds and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Our first case study in this part of the hearings concerned interaction between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the funeral insurance provider Aboriginal Community Benefit Fund, which we'll refer to as ACBF. The Commission heard evidence from Ms Tracy Walsh, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander woman from Marupna in Victoria. The Commission also heard evidence from Mr Bryn Jones, the CEO and a current director of ACBF. ACBF was founded in 1993. It markets itself as Australia's only funeral insurance plan dedicated to the Aboriginal community. <coughs> the organisation is not affiliated with or sponsored by any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander organisation or governmental organisation. None of its directors or managers are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people and only a small number of its employees so identify. ACBF has three types of funeral insurance policy on issue. The first, fund number two, is only available to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It has not accepted any new members since around 2004. At that time, following federal court proceedings brought by ASIC, alleging breach of the anti-hawking provisions in the Corporations Act, ACBF gave an undertaking to ASIC that it would st stop taking new members to that fund. The second policy is the community plan. The community plan has been offered by ACBF since 2005 as a result of ACBF's undertaking to ASIC to cease accepting new members of Fund 2. The community plan is a funeral expenses policy, which means that the corporate entity which offers it is not required to hold an Australian Financial Services licence and the obligations contained in Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act do not apply. The only restrictions on membership to this fund are age and health related. The third policy is the ACBF plan, which was also established in 2005 as a result of ACBF's undertaking to ASIC to cease accepting new members of Fund 2. Like the community plan, the ACBF plan is an expenses only funeral policy. It's available to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people under the age of 70. There are 13,460 policies presently on offer under the ACBF plan, almost five times the number of policies on offer under Fund 2 and the community plan put together. Approximately 36% of policyholders of the ACBF plan are under the age of 18. Turning to Ms Walsh's evidence, in late 2005, a representative from ACBF attended Ms Walsh's workplace. Ms Walsh understood ACBF to be an Aboriginal organisation because the brochures and posters that ACBF had displayed around her workplace used images and colours associated with Aboriginal culture and because the name of the organisation included the word Aboriginal. After speaking with the representative of ACBF, who Ms Walsh understood to be an Aboriginal person, Ms Walsh signed up to the ACBF plan. Ms Walsh's initial application form recorded her health level as level one, the least severe health rating. The application recorded that she would be offered a benefit amount of $12,000 with premiums of $18 a fortnight. 
ACBF subsequently advised Ms Walsh that it had reassessed her health level as level three, the most severe health rating, due to the fact that she was taking medication for depression. As a result, ACBF offered her a, re a reduced benefit amount of $8,000 for premium payments of $36 each fortnight. Ms Walsh <coughs> understood that the ACBF plan worked like a savings plan. Ms Walsh's understanding was that if she paid less than her benefit amount, she would be entitled to a payout of the full benefit amount. If she paid over the benefit amount, she thought that any overpayments would be paid to her family upon her death. During the life of the policy, Ms Walsh unsuccessfully attempted to increase her benefit amount on at least two occasions. By the end of 2016, Ms Walsh had paid over $10,000 to ACBF for a maximum benefit amount of $8,000. In May 2018, Ms Walsh's lawyers assisted her to lodge a complaint with FOS, which alleged misleading and deceptive conduct, unconscionable conduct and unlawful discrimination. This followed earlier correspondence between Ms Walsh's lawyers and ACBF on these matters, in which ACBF had sought to dissuade Ms Walsh from lodging a complaint with FOS. On the 7th of June this year, ACBF made submissions to FOS, strongly encouraging FOS to reject Ms Walsh's claims. On the same day, ACBF wrote to Ms Walsh's lawyers with a settlement offer by which ACBF offered to raise Ms Walsh's maximum benefit amount to $10,000 and to waive future payments. Mr Jones's evidence was that he had instructed ACBF's lawyers to settle the claim in order to avoid the legal costs associated with the claim and because he felt sympathetic towards Ms Walsh, given that she had paid premiums over her benefit amount. Mr Jones said that he did not believe that Ms Walsh had been misled about the character of ACBF, although he accepted that some documentation sent to Ms Walsh relating to the nature of the payout to which she would be entitled had included inaccurate wording. Ms Walsh has indicated that she will accept ACBF's offer. She said that before the offer was made, she did not feel as though she had any choice about whether to continue to pay ACBF for her plan. She felt as though ACBF had her over a barrel and she could not walk away from the large amount of money she had already paid. Turning to ACBF's marketing practices, since 1999, following action taken by ASIC, ACBF has been required by a court order to include a disclaimer in its advertising materials. The disclaimer is to the effect that ACBF is a private company, that it is not sponsored by or otherwise connected with any governmental body or Aboriginal organisation. Mr Jones conceded that notwithstanding this, some of ACBF's advertising material, including internet and radio advertising, had not included the disclaimer and that this appeared to be in breach of the court orders. The orders also required ACBF to remove from its marketing materials the Aboriginal flag and any suggestion that ACBF was established to advance the welfare of the Aboriginal community. In 2012, ACBF revamped its advertising strategy. Its new strategy included the adoption of a new logo using red, yellow and orange colours, accompanied by the tagline, For You, For Your Family. ACBF's recent promotional material includes the phrase, Over 20 years working in the Aboriginal community. And ACBF's website features imagery that resembles Indigenous dot artwork, as well as photos of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mr Jones conceded that there has been confusion over the years about whether ACBF is an Aboriginal-owned company. We turn to ACBF's sales processes. Until recently, ACBF had an arrangement with the Department of Human Services. Under this arrangement, ACBF could deduct the premiums of policyholders who receive Centrelink payments directly from those Centrelink payments by using the Centrepay system. 
ACBF was the only funeral insurer receiving payments through the centre pay system. A condition of its arrangement with the Department of Human Services was that ACBF was not permitted to sell its policies in an unsolicited setting. Following a decision by the government to remove funeral insurance from the centre pay system, which was the subject of an unsuccessful court challenge by ACBF, the condition regarding unsolicited sales is no longer operative. Mr Jones says, said that ACBF currently sells its product through inbound phone and website inquiries. Until recently, ACBF also engaged in door-to-door -door selling. Mr Jones told the Commission that ACBF has now ceased door-to-door -door selling. However, he said there were four Indigenous employees who were networking and working in field to create connections with bodies. Mr Jones conceded that their work involved looking for sales opportunities, including through land councils. <coughs> Mr Jones said that ACBF sales representatives ask customers and prospective customers about whether they have children they may want to sign up to funeral insurance policies. In ASIC's 2015 report, it found that ACBF was the only insurer with significant numbers of persons insured under 30 for which premiums were being paid and that 50% of persons insured by ACBF were aged under 20 and 33% were aged under 15. Mr Jones indicated that he intended to implement the recommendations of a cultural audit report provided to ACBF by Mira Connect. That report recommended that ACBF continue to leverage its existing customer base for the purpose of signing up new customers, including children and families. The Mira Connect report recommended that ACBF offer referral incentives to existing policyholders and research the benefits of offering family policies. In relation to the sale of policies of children, Mr Jones accepted that a motivating factor for ACBF is to sell as many policies as possible. ACBF explained that new policyholders are required to submit an application form that includes a health statement. ACBF then use a custom, uses a customer's disclosed pre-existing health conditions to determine a health level ranking from between level one to level three. This health level, along with the customer's age, determines the fortnightly premiums paid by the customer. Mr Jones said that the basis for designating certain conditions as level one, two or three was the assumed risk associated with insuring someone with certain health issues. Mr Jones appeared to accept that this meant that ACBF's, ACBF's health classification system resulted in higher premiums for people with medical conditions <coughs> that are more common amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. ACBF uses a stepped premium structure meaning that as each nominee <coughs> under the policy enters into a new age bracket, they pay a higher premium. Mr Jones accepted that ACBF's disclosure of its stepped premium structure may be inadequate. <coughs> Mr Jones also conceded that ACBF does not provide an upfront estimate of the total cost of its policy to its customers, contrary to recommendations made in relation to funeral insurance by ASIC in 2015. <coughs> Mr Jones accepted that ACBF plan holders could end up paying more in premiums than they would ever be entitled to re recover under their policies. Mr Jones accepted that ACBF did not clearly and prominently disclose this as a risk, again contrary to ASIC's recommendations in relation to funeral insurance. Mr Jones said that from January 2018, ACBF has released customers from paying further premiums if they've exceeded their maximum benefit payable, but only if the customer contacts ACBF and identifies that they are struggling to make contributions. 
Since then, ACBF has waived the future payments of 24 customers who have paid more than their entitlement. Mr Jones gave evidence that a policyholder's policy will be cancelled if they miss four payments within a year. Over the last five years, ACBF has cancelled 13,175 ACBF plan policies as a result of non-payment of premiums. Mr Jones gave evidence that 6,000 of those policies were cancelled following the decision by the government that funeral insurance providers could no longer be listed on centre pay. Mr Jones said that those people whose payments were cancelled as a result of the direct debits from centre pay being discontinued were uncontactable and the location of those persons was not known <coughs> to ACBF. Mr Jones said that, generally speaking, once a policy is cancelled, the customer will lose their cover and they will not be entitled to any refund or credit in respect of the amounts they have paid to ACBF. Until mid-2017, ACBF would not pay claims where the cause of death was suicide, although it would refund premiums in those circumstances. In his statement, Mr Jones said that ACBF's previous position had been adopted because customers and local community groups thought that paying out suicide claims could be seen to condone suicide. In cross-examination, Mr Jones accepted that at least one staff member had taken the view that ACBF had received backlash for not paying out on suicide. Mr Jones was taken to ACBF media releases dated the 27th and 29th of June this year and the 2nd of July this year. Mr Jones conceded that there were errors in relation to ACBF's claims about suicide payments in the first two of these media releases and that the incorrect statements were repeated in the third media release. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that ACBF may have engaged in misconduct in a number of ways. First, it's open to find that ACBF may have breached its obligations under Section 12, capital D, capital A of the ASIC Act to not engage in conduct that is misleading or deceptive or is likely to mislead or deceive and under Section 12, capital D, capital F, subsection 1 of the ASIC Act which prohibits a person from engaging in conduct that is liable to mislead the public as to the nature, the characteristics, the suitability for their purpose or the quantity of any financial services. Most significantly, ACBF represents that it uniquely provides a product and service tailored to meet the needs of Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and that its policies are beneficial for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It is open to find that ACBF's products and services, the sale of which is targeted to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, are not in fact tailored to meet the needs of these people or beneficial for those people for a number of reasons. First, ACBF's health classification system may result in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people paying more than they would if they obtained funeral insurance from another insurer. Second, until very recently, ACBF policies did not pay out for suicide, <coughs> despite the high rates of suicide in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. Third, as ASIC found in its 2015 report, ACBF is the only insurer with significant numbers of persons insured under 30 for whom premiums are being paid. It is open to find that ACBF plays on the cultural significance of funerals to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and Indigenous mortality statistics to actively sell its policies to children and young people in those communities in circumstances where they have little need for the product. Fourth, ACBF is not an Aboriginal organisation, nor is it affiliated with any Aboriginal or government organisation. Fifth, the ACBF policy is an expenses-only policy, 
This is not sufficiently clear from some of ACBF's promotional and marketing material. The policy is unlikely to cover all aspects of sorry business. Sixth, unlike some other policies available in the market, it is a design feature of the ACBF plan that any policyholder pay, may pay more in premiums than they will ever be entitled to receive. Separately, ACBF's current advertising materials, even with the disclaimer, which has not always <laughs> been used, may induce consumers into thinking that it's an Aboriginal-owned company. Its materials use colours, red, yellow and orange, associated with Aboriginal culture, and use imagery which is significant in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture. The name of the plan includes the word Aboriginal. The promotional material includes references to ACBF having spent over 20 years working in the Aboriginal community. And the plan is described as Australia's only funeral insurance plan dedicated to the Aboriginal community. As we've noted, some of ACBF's advertising material has failed to include the disclaimer that as ACBF is a privately owned company with no government or Aboriginal community affiliations. That is the first way in which we say it's open uh, to the Commissioner to find that ACBF may have engaged in misconduct. The second is that it's open to the Commissioner to find that ACBF may have breached Section 12, capital D, capital B, subparagraph E of the ASIC Act, which prohibits the making of a false or misleading representation that services have sponsorship, approval, performance characteristics, use of benefits. ACBF's marketing materials as a whole, and specifically ACBF's statements about its dedication to the Aboriginal community, convey a representation that ACBF has the approval or endorsement of the Aboriginal community in a general sense. On the evidence, it's also open to the Commissioner to find that ACBF engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. First, contrary to ASIC's recommendations, ACBF fails to adequately warn its policyholders that they may pay more under their policies than they will ever be entitled to receive by way of payout. Second, again contrary to ASIC's recommendations, ACBF fails to provide an upfront estimate of the total cost of the policy. Third, ACBF actively seeks to sell its policies to children and to young people in circumstances where they are unlikely to receive any benefit from the policy. Fourth, ACBF generally refuses to credit payments made towards a plan holder's previous plan if the plan holder reinstates a plan after cancellation. ACBF does this despite understanding that there is a very high rate of cancellations for non-payment of premiums across its policy holders. Fifth, ACBF fails to adequately disclose its waiting period to plan holders and at least historically provided confusing information to its plan holders about the completion of their waiting periods. Sixth, the product provided by ACBF is a very low value product when understood in light of the claims paid as a percentage of premiums received. In an ASIC report dated April 2014, the claims paid by ACBF as a percentage of the premiums received in the previous 12 months was 13.6%. This represented the lowest percentage out of the insurers surveyed. Mr Jones accepted that this data was concerning. Seventh, ACBF has breached the orders made by the Federal Court in 1999 in failing to consistently utilise the required disclaimer in its advertising materials. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that there are a number of causes of this misconduct which are attributable to ACBF's culture and governance practices and its remuneration practices. 
it is open to the Commissioner to find that the misconduct can be attributed, at least in part, to ACBF's remuneration and bonus scheme for its sales and field representatives. This scheme actively encouraged ACBF employees to aggressively target vulnerable persons and incentivise them to pursue signing up entire families, including their infant children. This is particularly the case in relation to the KPI structure evidenced in the 2018 letter of employment that was tendered, in which the staff member was to be paid $20 in respect of each of the first 29 nominees signed up, $30 in respect of each of the next 10, and so on, culminating in payments of $70 per nominee for the 70th to 100th nominees signed up. It is open to the Commissioner to find that ACBF uh, did not have a corporate culture which enabled it to communicate and sell its products to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in a respectful manner. The Mura Connect report found that the majority of ACBF staff are non-Indigenous and that there was a lack of cultural understanding and confidence amongst the staff. This in turn resulted in an environment in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were unlikely to be offered a service that was tailored to their needs. It's also open to find that ACBF did not effectively and adequately respond to the detriment <coughs> suffered by Ms Walsh, one of its customers, as a result of its misconduct. After misrepresenting the plan to Ms Walsh, and after Ms Walsh challenged ACBF's actions in this regard, ACBF corresponded with Ms Walsh in an aggressive and hostile manner over a significant period of time before finally making an offer to settle Ms Walsh's dispute. This was despite the fact that at the time that Ms Walsh's lawyers first complained to ACBF, Ms Walsh had already paid substantially more than she would ever be entitled to receive under her policy. ACBF is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of these open findings that we have identified, and all parties with leave to appear are invited to provide written submissions addressing the following questions, which arise both from the ACBF case study and from the select AFSL case study, to which we will shortly turn. The first question, is the current regulatory framework in respect of funeral expenses products adequate? In particular, should the framework be amended so that funeral expenses products are not excluded from the definition of financial product by virtue of section 765A1Y of the Corporations Act? and Regulation 7.1.07D of the Corporation Regulations 2001. 7.1.07 capital D. Thank you. Should Section 12, capital B, capital A, capital A, subparagraph 8, subparagraph O of the ASIC Act be amended to put beyond doubt that funeral expenses policies are not excluded from the definition of financial product as applicable to part two, division two of that act. Is the current regulatory framework sufficient to minimise the risk of funeral insurance providers using inappropriate sales practices to sell their products to vulnerable people, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living regionally or remotely? Is the current regulatory framework sufficient to minimise the risk of sales of unsuitable funeral products to these people, including to avoid the risk of individuals having multiple forms of funeral insurance and to address the sales of funeral insurance policies to children and young people? Does the current regulatory framework deal adequately with the potential for people with funeral insurance policies to pay more in premiums than may ever be paid out? And should the current regulatory framework be modified to include protections for holders of funeral insurance 
in relation to the cancellation of their policies for non-payment of premiums. The second case study relating to funeral insurance concerns select AFSL proprietary Just before limited. Before you leave that, is there also a general question about uh, uh, whether uh, estimates of total cost uh, should uh, be given? ASIC recommended that. They did, Commissioner. That's correct. And uh, as you will recall, Commissioner, in both our funeral insurance case study case studies, that recommendation has not been adopted. Yes, and uh, it may be time to get some submissions about uh, whether that's right or wrong. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, Select AFSL is a company which promotes and distributes various insurance products, including until relatively recently, funeral insurance. Now, this case study came to our attention upon review of a Bank of Queensland board report dated the 19th of July 2017, which was produced under a notice to produce issued by the Commission in <coughs> March 2018 in relation to inquiries that the Commission was making in connection with the second round of hearings, which related to the provision of financial advice. Within that report, there was a reference to a 2015 spike in funeral insurance sales by Select and to the existence of correspondence between Select, St Andrews and ASIC in relation to that spike. From reviewing that report in connection with our fi financial advice inquiries, um, we determined that it would be appropriate to issue a rubric uh, in respect of that matter to select. The funeral insurance mis-selling issue that uh, the Commission has heard about had not been disclosed to the Commission before that point because Select had not been invited to disclose its misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations, and the Bank of Queensland, which had been invited to disclose its misconduct, did not consider that it was able to disclose that matter. In the Bank of Queensland's submission to the Commissioner on the 29th of January 2018, under the heading St Andrews and Distribution Arrangements, the Bank of Queensland told the Commission that it was constrained in providing its response by confidentiality obligations to third parties arising in contract. Contractual, confidential, contractual confidentiality obligations of this kind were said to be contained in arrangements between St Andrews and third party distributors of its products. Also in that document, the Bank of Queensland told the Commission that it would welcome the opportunity to provide further detail of issues that have arisen in relation to third party distributors in circumstances which will not risk the breach of any contractual confidentiality obligations. So there was no reference to select uh, or to the mis-selling issue, but there was clear reference to the Bank of Queensland's understanding that it was constrained by contractual confidentiality obligations uh, to select from disclosing the misconduct. But as I've explained, Commissioner, uh, we managed to detect the issue via that board report that was produced in our financial advice investigations. Now, turning to the substance of the case study, the Commission heard evidence from Ms Marika a Yolnu woman who's originally from East Arnhem Land and now lives in regional New South Wales. Ms Marika is 60 years old and English is not her first language. Ms Marika was sold two funeral insurance policies by Select, trading as Let's Insure, in 2015. The Commission also heard evidence from Mr Russell Howden, the Managing Director of Select. In August 2015, an external lead provider rang Ms Marika. Ms Marika does not know how they got her phone number. 
The person told Ms Marika that they were calling to conduct a one-minute survey. In the course of the call, Ms Marika told the person that she already had funeral insurance. The salesperson responded that he was not here to sell her a second insurance. Obviously, that would be pointless. The next day, a Let's Insure representative called Ms Marika to see if he could switch her to Let's Insure. Ms Marika told the representative that she couldn't have two policies and that she was happy with the other one. Mr Howden accepted that Ms Marika did not want to receive either of these telephone calls. Mr Howden also accepted that both representatives were aware that Ms Marika already had funeral insurance and that she clearly indicated that she did not have any interest in taking out further funeral insurance. Despite this, Let's Insure called Ms Marika again on the 9th of September 2015. On that day, Let's Insure sold Ms Marika two funeral insurance policies covering herself, her three children and her five grandchildren. Before Ms Marika agreed to take out the policies, the salesperson said to her, you can actually have two at the same time and that is what most people tend to do because with their one with work, it only covers them and they say it expires when they stop working, <coughs> which means your family don't get the money. Mr Howden accepted that the representative was not authorised to make these statements and that the statements should not have been made in circumstances where the representative did not have details of the work policy to which Ms Marika referred. Before Ms Marika agreed to take out the policies, she received an oral product disclosure statement. She was not asked for her consent to receive the product disclosure statement in this way. <clears throat> Ms Marika's evidence was that she found the select representative who she spoke to in this call difficult to understand. Amongst other things, he spoke really fast, like a train, and before she could think about how to answer his questions, he would just start speaking again. She said she was just trying to catch up with the language, so she kept saying yes. Ms Marika said that she found the call confusing and frustrating. The representative did not wait for her to speak or to finish what she was saying and she felt that he did not treat her with respect. Mr Howden accepted that there were multiple occasions in this call in which Ms Marika appeared confused. Mr Howden also accepted that there were sufficient signals during the call that suggested that Ms Marika may not have fully understood the product she was purchasing and the consequences of the purchase. The following day, the same select representative called Ms Marika, offering her Coles Meyer vouchers if she provided the contact details of family friends and if they in turn took out policies with Let's Insure. The representative said at one point, you never know if you've got like 30 names and numbers, you get $600. Despite being induced to go through her old phone and her new phone to find and provide the contact details of family and friends, Ms Marika never received any vouchers. Mr Howden accepted that the conduct on the part of the representative was unreasonable and constituted a gross abuse of Select's referral program. Less than a week later, on the 16th of September 2015, Ms Marika called Let's Insure to try to cancel her policies because she could not afford to keep them. Another Let's Insure employee called her back. Ms Marika told her, I'm not getting enough money to be able to pay for the insure. The employee convinced Ms Marika to retain the policies on the basis that she would waive the premium payments for a month in response to a question as to whether this was a fair way to conduct the call in light of the statutory cooling off period, Mr Howden responded that it was. In December 2016, with legal assistance, Ms Marika was able to cancel her policies. In a letter to her lawyers containing a settlement offer, Let's Insure maintained that at all times it had acted properly and in accordance with the law but stated that it was prepared to refund the premiums. 
There was no evidence that any disciplinary action was taken against the sales representative <coughs> at this time, although Mr Howden conceded that representatives of Select would have listened to the recording of the call in which the sale was made. Mr Howden accepted that although the payment to Ms Marika uh, had been described to her lawyers as an act of goodwill, it should more appropriately have been characterised as a recognition that Ms Marika had been paying for a policy that she did not need, she did not want and she did not understand. Ms Marika was only one of a significant number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who were missold funeral insurance by Select in 2015. Mr Howden gave evidence about the spike in sales to customers living in 43 postcodes with a high proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mr Howden principally attributed the spike to two sales incentive arrangements and to abuses of Select's referral processes by two particular sales representatives. Mr Howden was questioned about three likely contributors to the spike. The aggressive sales tactics that its representatives were trained to use, the KPIs and incentives that were in place, and the adequacy of Select's quality assurance and disciplinary frameworks. In relation to Select's sales tactics, the Commission heard evidence that Select representatives were trained to actively overcome obstacles, including potential customers already having a funeral insurance policy or not being able to afford the policy. Select emphasised to its representatives that there was no impediment to making a sale to a customer who already held funeral insurance with another company. It was permissible to play upon a customer's fears in order to sell policies, and they should assume the customer's response is positive and lead the customer to mandatory confirmation. While Mr Howden maintained that Select did not sanction aggressive sales tactics, he accepted that Select did push its agents with productivity targets and that this may have been a contributor to the spike. In relation to remuneration and incentives, in 2015, commissions were payable on the first year's premium for sales originated by a sales representative. The premiums comp comprised, on average, 30% of a sales representative's remuneration. In addition, during 2015, Select ran sales incentive campaigns offering a Vespa scooter and a cruise as prizes for high volumes of sales. Select also had a number of other incentives in place from time to time. The commission structure and the sales incentive campaigns encouraged Select representatives to sell aggressively and did not adequately discourage select staff members from mis-selling policies. In relation to quality assurance, <laughs> Mr Howden gave evidence that at the time that select sold the policies to Ms Marika, it undertook random reviews of sales calls by its agents. Select listened to more calls from junior agents than from senior agents. Select used a scorecard which featured binary questions such as, was a PDS given? Depending on the nature of the failure, if a sales representative failed one of the categories, Select provided coaching and feedback to the representative. From 2016, Select moved to a system involving phone licences, by which Select would record points against a sales agent for certain specified breaches. Points were allocated according to severity of the breach. The breaches for each call were not cumulative. Agents would only be penalised for the most significant breach on a particular call, meaning that a maximum of 10 points could be deducted per call. Agents were allocated a maximum of 30 points, which were reinstated every six weeks. Within a period of six weeks, if a representative lost 10 points, they received a formal warning. If a representative lost 20 points, they received a second formal warning. And if a representative lost 30 points, they lost their phone licence and would be dismissed. The Commission heard evidence that under this system, 
it was possible to complete an unethical sale or to provide personal advice to a potential customer in breach of the Corporations Act and to only have 10 points deducted from the agent's phone licence. Mr Howden was asked whether Select's quality assurance systems were sufficiently robust to deter and detect misconduct. Mr Howden maintained that those systems were sufficiently robust, but conceded that they were insufficient to deter the misconduct of the two Select representatives who had significantly contributed to the 2015 spike in funeral insurance sales to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers. Before departing from Select's policies, it should be noted that the majority of Select's policies employ a stepped premium structure. Select also gave evidence about its dealings with ASIC and with St Andrews, the issuer of the funeral insurance policies sold by Select. On the 17th of January 2017, St Andrews made a voluntary disclosure to ASIC in relation to the potential mis-selling of funeral insurance by Select in 2015. Select has maintained the position that no significant breach notification was required in respect of mis-selling of funeral insurance to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Nevertheless, Select has agreed to remediate affected customers. In early 2018, ASIC expressed significant and extensive concerns with Select about Select's life insurance sales practices. ASIC characterised its concerns as being not dissimilar to the concerns that had been identified in rela relation to Select's sales of funeral insurance in 2015. The concerns included, but were not limited to, applying pressure to close sales, even where the consumer raises a concern, using the cooling off period and delayed payment to close sales and failing to explain features of the policy. Mr Howden accepted that there was overlap between the funeral insurance mis-selling conduct in 2015 and the life insurance related conduct in 2018. On the 19th of March this year, Select ceased distributing funeral insurance. Mr Howden did not accept that it had ceased sales activities as a result of St Andrew's request that it do so until it had improved its compliance and sales practices. Around this time, Select corresponded with St Andrew's and the Bank of Queensland about how to manage its relationship with the Royal Commission. On the 19th of February this year, the Bank of Queensland requested Select's formal consent to voluntarily disclose to the Commission issues relating to Select's sale of funeral and life insurance. Select refused to provide this consent and stated that it did not consider there to have been any misconduct or conduct falling short of community standards or expectations arising out of any matter which would bring it within the scope of the Commission's terms of reference. Select maintained this position in subsequent correspondence with St Andrews. As a result, Select's mis-selling of funeral insurance was not voluntarily disclosed to the Commission. <coughs> On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that Select may have engaged in misconduct in the following ways. First, in the course of selling the funeral insurance policies to Ms Marika in September 2015, Select breached section 952 capital C of the Corporations Act by providing personal advice to Ms Marika. The sales representative advised Ms Marika that she could have more than one funeral insurance policy in place at one time and suggested that she would cease to be covered by her existing funeral insurance policy when she stopped working. Mr Howden accepted that the representative was not authorised or licensed to provide personal advice and that the representative had probably contravened section 952C of the Corporations Act. Second, in the course of selling the funeral insurance policies to Ms Marika in September 2015, Select breached section 992 capital A subsection 3 subparagraph E of the Corporations Act 
by providing an oral product disclosure statement to Ms Marika without expressly obtaining her consent. Mr Howden accepted that Ms Marika was not asked for consent. It's unclear whether this breach occurred on other occasions in relation to other customers, but it appears likely given that select sales scripts at that time did not include any prompt to request the customer's express consent to provision of a PDS orally. Third, by selling funeral insurance to Ms Marika, Select engaged in unconscionable conduct, contrary to sections 12CA or 12CB of the ASIC Act. Mr Howden accepted that in all of the circumstances, including Ms Marika's expressed wish not to purchase the insurance and her lack of understanding about the product that she was purchasing and the consequences of the purchase, <coughs> it was unconscionable for Select to have sold the policies to Ms Marika. Fourth, the two sales representatives to which Select principally attributed the spike in 2015 funeral insurance sales also engaged in unconscionable conduct contrary to <coughs> sections 12CA or 12CB of the ASIC Act. Those representatives used Select's referral program to actively target Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people for potential sales. In the termination letters that Select provided to those two representatives, Select told the representatives that there was no doubt in the company's mind that they had failed to act in the utmost good faith by taking advantage of people in the postcodes with high proportions of Indigenous clients. Fifth, Select failed to notify ASIC under section 912D of the Corporations Act that by the actions of its employees, it had engaged in significant breaches of its obligations under section 912 capital A of that Act. Amongst other things, it had failed to ensure that it did all things necessary to ensure that the financial services it provided were provided honestly and fairly. It failed to have in place adequate arrangements for the management of conflicts of interest <coughs> between the interests of its policies, policy holders or potential policy holders and the interests of its sales representatives. And it failed to take reasonable steps to ensure that its representatives complied with the financial services laws. Sixth, it's open to the Commissioner to find that the actions of the two select representatives also constituted a breach of section 13 of the Insurance Contracts Act. Upon the termination of their employment, Select told the employees that there was no doubt in the company's mind that they had failed to act in the utmost good faith by taking advantage of people in the postcodes with high proportions of Indigenous clients. On the evidence, it's also open to the Commissioner to make the following findings of conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to select. First, it was deeply inappropriate for the select sales representative to induce Ms Marika to provide the names and contact details of a significant <coughs> number of family and friends during the phone call on the 10th of September 2015. Mr Howden accepted that this conduct was unreasonable and that it represented a gross abuse of Select's referral program. Second, when coupled with Select's sales culture and Select's remuneration and KPI arrangements, the referral program used by Select clearly carried a risk that Select representatives would missell funeral insurance policies. It fell below community standards and expectations for Select to use such a program in circumstances where it had not put in place adequate safeguards to ensure that the program would not be abused. Third, it was also inappropriate for a Select representative to dissuade Ms Marika from cancelling her policies a week after she took them out by offering her one month's free coverage in circumstances when Ms Marika had expressed serious concerns about affordability. The representative dissuaded Ms Marika from cancelling her policies 
in circumstances where Ms Marika had a statutory right to cancel her policy in writing for 14 days and the product disclosure statement that was applicable to her policy afforded her 30 days to cancel her policy. Fourth, contrary to ASIC's recommendation, SELECT also fails to provide an upfront estimate of the total costs of its policies. On the evidence, it's open to the Commissioner to find that there were a number of causes of the misconduct which are attributable to culture and governance practices and to remuneration practices. First, it's open to the Commissioner to find that a significant cause of the misconduct was SELECT's sales training. SELECT encouraged its employees to sell aggressively and to overcome objections in such a way that was designed not to permit potential purchasers to exit the selling process. Second, it's open to find that another significant cause of the misconduct was SELECT's remuneration and incentive structure. As we've noted, Mr Howden accepted that SELECT pushed its agents with productivity targets. SELECT also provided very significant incentives which attracted its representatives to sell policies at all costs and did not appropriately deter potential misconduct. Third, it's open to find that SELECT did not have adequate internal systems in place to deter or detect misconduct within its organisation. SELECT's quality assurance system in 2015 and even as revamped in 2016 was inadequate to stop SELECT representatives from engaging in misconduct on calls and to allow SELECT to realise when such misconduct took place. By way of example, Mr Howden only became aware of the mis-selling to Ms Marika upon being told about Ms Marika's case by the Royal Commission. SELECT is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings we've identified as open and all parties with leave to appear are uh, invited to provide written submissions addressing the same questions that we have already outlined in relation to the ACBF case study. I turn to our case studies involving ANZ. Our first case, case study relating to ANZ focused on the experience of an ANZ customer who lived in a remote community in the Northern Territory, whose nearest bank branch was in Catherine, around 100 kilometres away. The Commission heard evidence from Ms T Doe, a senior family support worker with Save the Children, and from Mr Anthony Tapsell, ANZ's General Manager, Retail Branch Network, Northern Queensland and Northern Territory. Ms Doe works with Save the Children in Catherine. She's not a financial counsellor, but her work sometimes involves assisting clients with financial matters, including their dealings with banks. Ms Doe gave evidence about the assistance she provided to a particular client from a remote community near Catherine to open an ANZ Access Basic account. Ms Doe told the Commission that her client is an Aboriginal woman in her 30s who is a single mother of three school-aged children. Her client speaks two Aboriginal languages and English is not her first language. Her main source of income is Centrelink payments. The remote community has one privately owned ATM, which meant that every time Ms Doe's client would check her balance at the ATM or try to withdraw money, she would be charged an ATM fee. Ms Doe told the Commission that her client was being charged a significant amount in ATM fees, dishonour fees and overdrawn fees. Ms Doe explained that the dishonour fees resulted from rejected direct debit payments. Ms Doe told the Commission that she and her colleague researched the available fee-free accounts and determined that ANZ had a particular product that would be suitable for her client, called an Access Basic Account. The Access Basic Account was designed for concession card holders, had no monthly service fee and did not incur dishonour or overdrawn fees. Ms Doe told the Commission that on the 19th of December last year, she drove the one and a half hours from Catherine to the remote community to pick up her client's sister. 
they attended the ANZ Catherine branch to open an account. They were told by the ANZ banker that it would not be possible to open an Access Basic account without a prior appointment. Mr Tapsell told the Commission that it was now common practice to require a customer to make an appointment to open a bank account. Ms Doe then made an appointment for both her client and her sister on the 21st of December last year. On that date, she drove again to the remote community to collect her client and her sister. Her client asked Ms Doe to support her in the appointment with ANZ to help her understand the conversation. Ms Doe and her clients attended the appointment at the Catherine ANZ branch and Ms Doe informed the banker that they were there to open an Access Basic account. Ms Doe explained that her clients wanted a fee-free account, particularly one that didn't attract dishonour <coughs> or overdrawn fees, and a savings account. The banker asked Ms Doe's client a series of questions in relation to her budget, expenses and savings. Ms Doe said that she wasn't sure whether her client understood the purpose or implications of those questions and whether she meant for her answers to be taken literally by the banker. At the end of the questions, the banker suggested that the client set up a direct debit arrangement to transfer $100 a fortnight from her Centrelink payments into the new savings account. Ms Doe told the banker that she wasn't sure that her client understood the implications of the direct debit and that this was a significant proportion of her client's income. The banker did not at that time put the direct debit arrangement in place. Ms Doe said that the banker also set up internet banking for her client during this appointment and they went through a process of setting up security questions. Towards the end of the meeting, the banker turned her computer screen around to show the accounts that had been set up. Ms Doe saw that the screen listed a Progress Saver account and an Access Advantage account. Ms Doe expressed confusion about why that account had been opened because it hadn't been discussed during the meeting. The banker told Ms Doe that it was not possible to open an Access Basic account at the branch. Ms Doe asked the banker about the Access Advantage account that had been opened. She was told that it attracted monthly fees, but the banker said she could waive them. She was also told it attracted dishonour and overdrawn fees, but that they shouldn't be an issue as long as the customer didn't overdraw her account. The banker was unable to assist the client and her sister further on that day. Following the appointment, Ms Doe telephoned ANZ to ask whether it was true that the Access Basic account was available only to existing customers. Ms Doe was informed that the account was available to new and existing customers as long as they supply suitable identification and supporting documents at a local branch. After the call, Ms Doe went to the branch to confirm that they had kept copies of the documents her client had provided. Ms Doe again travelled to the community on the 4th of January this year, where she assisted her client to access her internet banking account. Upon logging in, Ms Doe noticed that the accounts listed for her client were a Progress Saver account and now a Pensioner Advantage account. On the 15th of February, Ms Doe again met with her client and they called ANZ with the intention of changing her Pensioner Advantage account to an Access Basic account. At first, Ms Doe was told it was not possible to do this over the phone. After making a second phone call, she was told that it would be possible for her client to change her account, but because her client had failed to verify her identity using a verbal password on a previous occasion, it was not possible to do it that day. The operator suggested that they attend the Catherine ANZ branch to verify the client's identity. However, the branch was closed that day due to a plumbing issue. Ms Doe made a formal complaint to ANZ that day. On the 1st of March, Ms Doe attended the ANZ Catherine <coughs> branch with her client again, and they successfully re-verified her client's identity. They also asked to change the account to an Access Basic account and were told that it was not possible. On the same day, Ms Doe and her client telephoned ANZ to try and change her client's account over the phone. They were told that it was not possible to do this. The operator instead opened a new Access Basic account as an additional account. 
the operator asked Ms Doe's client to send him a text message to confirm that she was requesting a new key card for the account. Ms Doe's client was unable to do this as she did not have enough credit on her phone. Ms Doe told the Commission that by the end of this phone conversation, her client had a Progress Saver account, a Pensioner Advantage account, which carried a high risk of dishonour and overdrawn fees, and she also had an Access Basic account, which she couldn't access because she wasn't able to request a new key card in the way required by ANZ. All up, it took about four months for Ms Doe's client, even with the assistance of Ms Doe, to open a fee-free account with ANZ, despite her being eligible for such an account from the outset. Ms Doe contacted ASIC's Indigenous Outreach Program and provided feedback in writing. She was later contacted by a woman named Emma from ANZ's Complaints Department and they discussed solutions for her client. Ms Doe was told she would need a written authority from her client and she forwarded a written authority on the 27th of June this year. Since then, she's received further correspondence in relation to delivery of the key card to her client. When that is received, Ms Doe's client will need to activate the key card by telephoning ANZ. Mr Tapsell told the Commission that in preparing to give his evidence, he had spoken with the ANZ employees who dealt with Ms <coughs> Doe and her client. Mr Tapsell's statement outlined two versions of events, that of Ms Doe and that of the banker. Mr Tapsell had ascertained the banker's version of events at a meeting in Melbourne, which both he and the banker had travelled to. In his oral evidence, Mr Tapsell told the Commission that he had put forward two versions of events and was not making a call on which version was right. In circumstances where Ms Doe gave sworn oral evidence to the Commission and produced a contemporaneous file note, to the extent that there are any inconsistencies between the two accounts, Ms Doe's account should be preferred. So it occurs to me that there may be a further consideration, which is that the account given by the banker uh, was given to her superior uh, in course of an inquiry about a complaint that had been made about her conduct. Yes, just so, Commissioner. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ failed to make information available in an accessible manner to Ms Doe's client about banking services that may have been relevant to her in breach of clause 8 subparagraph A of the Code of Banking Practice. It is open to find that after ANZ received a request to provide details of appropriate accounts for Ms Doe's client, ANZ failed to provide details of accounts which were suitable to Ms Doe's needs in breach of Clause 8, subparagraph B of the Code of Banking Practice. As noted in the Code, this information can include details of ANZ's accounts which attract no or low standard fees and charges. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ failed to adequately assist Ms Doe's client and her sister in meeting identification requirements by failing to notify them of the differing ways in which the identification requirements could be met in breach of Clause 8, subparagraph C of the Code of Banking Practice. It is also open to find that ANZ failed to appropriately train its staff who were regularly dealing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers to be culturally aware, contrary to Clause 8, subparagraph D of the Code of Banking Practice. Each of those matters um, invoke available findings of misconduct. On the evidence, it's also open to the Commissioner to make findings that ANZ engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. First, to the extent that this does not constitute <coughs> misconduct, ANZ did not take reasonable steps to make information about their banking services accessible to Ms Doe's client 
and failed to tell Ms Doe's client about accounts and services that were relevant to her. The ANZ banker did not explain the availability of a fee-free account to Ms Doe's client, despite multiple inquiries indicating that she would be eligible for one. ANZ banking staff gave incorrect advice that the ANZ Access Basic account was not available to new customers. The ANZ banker opened an account for Ms Doe's client that was inappropriate for a person in her circumstances due to the risk of attracting dishonour and overdrawn fees. The most appropriate account should have been set up immediately, especially in circumstances where the client was travelling from a community that was a one and a half hour drive from the branch. The second way in which ANZ's conduct... Well, the, uh, more the more general question may be, uh, in what circumstances, in, if any, is it appropriate for a bank to challenge directly or indirectly a customer's expressed wish to have a basic account? If the customer comes in, especially if the customer comes in with a support person and the request is made for a basic account, in what circumstances, if any, is it appropriate for the bank to challenge that request, <coughs> whether that challenge takes the form of exploring the customer's, quote, needs, unquote, or otherwise? Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the, the second way in which we say it's open for the Commissioner to make findings of conduct that fell below community standards and expectations arises from the multiple occasions on which ANZ failed to open the appropriate account or to assist Ms Doe's client to change her account type over the phone after a less appropriate account was opened. Thirdly, we say that the questions asked in the A to Z review were not appropriate for somebody with limited English and limited financial literacy and the security questions posed for Ms Doe's client for in internet banking were also inappropriate. Fourth, again to the extent that this is not misconduct, ANZ failed to help Ms Doe's client to meet identification requirements over the phone and failed to take into account geographic barriers which made it difficult for Ms Doe's client to attend the branch to verify her identity. Mr Tapsell agreed that at least two of the calls where Ms Doe's client failed the identification process were a graphic demonstration of the difficulties that can be encountered by some Indigenous people in dealing with the bank by telephone. It was plain that Ms Doe's client was struggling to answer the verification questions and that other clients of ANZ have encountered similar difficulties. Finally, again to the extent that this is not already misconduct, the ANZ staff member in the Catherine branch was not effectively trained to assist Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers. Mr Tapsell's evidence was that staff members in branches with higher concentrations of Indigenous customers are not given any specific training in assisting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers. The more general point that I think may emerge at first sight seems to be a merely captious point about language, but it is, I think, uh, rather more important than that. Uh, it is to observe the progression from what is described as an identification of a customer's needs to a provoked expression of want by a customer to a sale to the customer. That is, the language of need is equated with 
the answer that is given to a question, would you like? Many things that, uh, uh, many ways in which that question can be framed in a way where the only answer available is, yes, I'd like that. And then to, trans to go from that to sales. As I say, the point can be dismissed as a merely captious point about language. I would be glad if parties who think it appropriate to make submissions about it attempted to grapple with the problem uh, that may lie behind the issues of language which I have identified. I'm provoked by the fact that Ms Doe gave evidence, did she not, of uh, uh, her client being asked, uh, in effect, do you want to save? What for? Yes. Furniture? How much? Oh, thousands. Uh, well, what say we say 5,000? Now, <coughs> the, the progression is, is perfectly understandable. You can hear it playing out. But behind the language, there are some, I think there may be, some quite uh, important and rather deeper questions. Commissioner, we invite ANZ to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings we've identified as opening, as being open, uh, and we invite all parties with leave to appear to provide written submissions addressing the following questions, which arise from this case study. First, do banks take sufficient steps to promote the availability of fee-free accounts to eligible customers? Second, are banks' identification requirements appropriate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers? If so, are those identification requirements sufficiently understood and implemented by staff on the ground? Third, do financial services entities have in place appropriate policies and procedures to assist Torres, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to overcome obstacles associated with geographical remoteness, to address the cultural barriers to engagement that some of these people face, to address the linguistic barriers to engagement that some of these people face, and to address the obstacles posed by the financial literacy levels of some of these people. And if appropriate policies and procedures are not in place, what changes should be made to those policies and procedures to deal with those matters? And finally, should more banks have a telephone service staffed by employees with specific training in assisting Indigenous consumers. The Commissioner will recall from our opening statement the ICAL line operated by the Commonwealth Bank as an example of one such service. <coughs> Uh, Commissioner, our final case study concerned ANZ and informal overdrafts offered on some transaction accounts. This case study focused in particular on the position of ANZ customers on Groot Island. The Commission heard evidence from Mr Philip Bowden, a financial counsellor with Anglicare Northern Territory, and from Mr Anthony Tapsell of ANZ. In his oral evidence, Mr Bowden explained that Groot Island has a population of about 1,500 people, a high proportion of whom are Indigenous. There are three main townships and a privately operated mine. Mr Bowden said that there is a wide range of both literacy 
uh, and financial literacy levels in the Groot Island community, but that most of the clients that he assists have low levels of financial literacy. As an example, Mr Bowden referred to a client with a negative account balance who had not understood the effect of a negative symbol. The client was confused as to why she was unable to withdraw her funds. Mr Bowden gave evidence that English was not the first language of many of his clients and that it could easily be the person's third or fourth language. Informal overdrafts, which are sometimes referred to as shadow limits, provide an account holder with the capacity to draw more funds from their account than are available on deposit at that point in time. Informal overdrafts attach to certain ANZ accounts unless automatic exclusionary criteria are applied to the account by ANZ's IT system. There is no action required by a client to establish an informal overdraft. It attaches to an account at the sole discretion of ANZ. Mr Tapsell gave evidence that ANZ customers were notified of the possible availability of an informal overdraft by Clause 2.19 of ANZ's Terms and Conditions, a 104-page document. Mr Tapsell agreed that even after reading all 104 pages, a customer would only know whether there was a possibility that they may be offered an informal overdraft. Mr Tapsell accepted that the community would expect ANZ to be more upfront about the prospect of an informal overdraft being attached to an account. It was open to ANZ customers to opt out of informal overdrafts by completing the requisite form, by attending at a branch or via telephone banking. Mr Tapsell gave evidence that at the time of his first statement, he did not know that an informal overdraft could be turned off over the phone. Once an account with an informal overdraft becomes overdrawn by $50 or more, a fee of $6 a day is applied for each business day the account remains overdrawn for a maximum of 10 business days per month. Interest is also charged at the ANZ retail index rate plus a margin of 8.5%. At the time of his witness statement, the rate of interest charged by ANZ on overdrawn amounts was 17.2% per annum. Mr Tapsell accepted that it is difficult for a customer to ascertain rate of interest charged on overdrawn accounts. Mr Bowden gave evidence of the particular circumstances of two of Anglicare Northern Territory's clients. Each client had met with a financial capability worker employed by Anglicare Northern Territory. Mr Bowden had reviewed the financial capability worker's notes and spoken with her before giving evidence. Mr Bowden gave evidence that client one was referred to the financial capability worker by Centrelink because the client's family would often take his bank card and spend money from the client's account, causing the client's account to be overdrawn on multiple occasions. As a consequence, on some occasions, the client's Centrelink payments were used to clear the overdrawn amount, leaving him without funds in the account. The client spoke little to no English and was struggling to understand the concept of an overdraft. The financial capability worker asked a Centrelink worker to act as a translator so as to enable the client to better understand and the client agreed to turn off the overdraft feature on his account. The financial capability worker assisted the client to talk to the bank and confirmed that the client currently had an overdraft and asked for it to be switched off. Once the informal overdraft was removed, the client had a debt of $600, which was to be progressively paid off from his Centrelink payments. The financial capability worker ensured that the 90% arrangements under the Code of Operation applied, so that only 10% of each Centrelink payment could be applied towards the outstanding debt. Mr Bowden gave evidence that Client 2 was referred to the financial capability worker because she wanted to learn how to save and because her account was overdrawn by $310.
When first referred to Anglicare, the client did not understand what an overdraft was. The financial capability worker provided some education about overdrafts and the client decided to contact the bank to cancel any applicable overdraft. Mr Bowden explained that the financial capability worker assisted the client to call the bank but was informed that the request could not be made over the phone and that it would be necessary to visit a branch. The financial capability worker drove the client to the branch. At the branch, the client was told that it was possible to cancel the overdraft, that because the account was locked at that time, it would be necessary to return to the bank on Friday after the client's Centrelink payment had been deposited so that the outstanding balance could be cleared. Mr Bowden gave evidence that after this payment had been received, the financial capability worker assisted the client to return to the branch and take out cash from her account. 10% of her family benefit payment was used to pay back the overdraft. Because the client took money, leaving the account overdrawn, her account remained locked until the overdraft was paid off. The code of operation, to which we referred in our opening statement, is a voluntary code to which ANZ is a signatory. Under the code, the default position is that a customer should be able to retain at least 90% of their income support payment or Department of Veterans Affairs payments in any fortnightly period. Mr Tapsell conceded that ANZ's current policies in relation to the 90% rules do not meet the requirements of the code. That is because the code places the onus on the bank to implement the 90% arrangements, whereas ANZ only implements such arrangements after a customer has made a request to enter into the 90% arrangements. Mr Tapsell conceded that ANZ's current policy was not good enough and that ANZ's customers were entitled to expect more. He gave evidence that as of earlier this week, there were high level discussions underway within ANZ in relation to the application of the code. It's open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ engaged in misconduct by failing to comply with the Code of Operation, which is a widely adopted benchmark for conduct to which ANZ is a signatory. Specifically, Mr Tapsell conceded that ANZ's current policies and procedures in respect of its so-called 90% arrangements do not conform with the Code of Operation. Contrary to the Code, ANZ places the onus on its customers to opt in to the 90% arrangements. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ may have engaged in misconduct by failing to provide effective disclosure of information relating to the attachment of informal overdrafts to transaction accounts and the fees and interest charges applicable to informal overdrafts. This conduct may be in breach of clause 3.1b1 of the Code of Banking Practice. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ may have failed to provide information relating to the attachment of informal overdrafts to transaction accounts and the fees and interest charges applicable to informal overdrafts in an accessible manner, contrary to clause 8, subparagraph A of the Code of Banking Practice. As recognised by Mr Tapsell, even after reading a 104-page document, a customer would only be aware of the possibility that they may be offered an informal overdraft. Finally, it is also open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ may have engaged in misconduct by breaching the obligation in Clause 3.2 of the Code of Banking Practice to act fairly and reasonably towards its clients. ANZ continued to charge clients high fees for informal overdrafts in circumstances where the overdraft was not sought by the client and the fees and charges applicable to the informal overdraft were not readily ascertainable. It's also open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ's conduct in providing informal overdrafts with high rates of interest and high fees to customers with low incomes on an opt-in rather than opt-out basis 
was conduct falling below community standards and expectations. It's open to find that the misconduct and conduct that fell below community standards and expectations was attributable to a culture that was inadequately concerned with placing customers in the most appropriate product and more concerned with revenue enhancement. By granting informal overdrafts on an opt-out rather than opt-in basis, including to accounts held by low-income earners, ANZ prioritised its own position over that of some of its customers. I'm sorry, Commissioner, I did say earlier um, that they were provided to customers with low incomes on an opt-in rather than an opt-out basis. I should have said on an opt-out rather than an opt-in basis. It's open to the Commissioner to find that the misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations was the result of inadequate internal systems at ANZ. While the Code of Operation anticipates that the default position is that customers who receive a defined benefit and have an account that is overdrawn should be placed on the 90% arrangements, ANZ has no systems for monitoring people who are eligible for the Code of Operation. We invite all parties with leave to appear to provide written submissions dealing with the following questions. Is it appropriate for informal overdrafts to be available in connection with basic accounts? If so, what policies and procedures should banks put in place to minimise the risk of consumer detriment in respect of those products? Would it be appropriate for well, informal... Is it a question of appropriate or is it lawful? It may have to be both questions, may it not? Is it one appropriate? Is it... Well, I rather think the order should be different. One, is it lawful? Two, if lawful, is it appropriate? Yes, Commissioner. Is it lawful for informal overdrafts to be offered on an opt-in rather than an opt-out basis to recipients of government benefits in circumstances where the costs of utilising the informal overdrafts are high and where informal overdrafts may not be adequately notified to customers? Is that lawful and is it appropriate? Should any other aspect of the current regulatory regime in respect of informal overdrafts be reformed to minimise the risk of consumer detriment? And do ADIs presently have adequate policies in place for the implementation of the code of operation? Those are the questions we pose, Commissioner. Now, that concludes our closing address. There are two matters um, that I want to refer to. Uh, one is I need to give you, Commissioner, the document ID for a document I tendered earlier, which was the written document dealing with the CBA processing errors case study. Which became... Uh, an exhibit, I thought. It was an exhibit, and I was going to provide you, Commissioner, with the doc ID. I'm yeah. sorry, we're just trying to locate what the exhibit number was. So am I. We have it. It is exhibit 4.135. It's 135, is it? 135 was an eon no. ago. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. We're still looking, Commissioner. 4.219. 219. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Now, 
So the doc ID for Exhibit 4.219 will be? RCD 9999-0062-0001. Thank you. And the second matter, Commissioner, is uh, I, I don't believe yet, Commissioner, you have said anything about the timeline for the receipt of written submissions in oh, relation to this. I um, have I, not, and yes. I was about to. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> um, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, as in past rounds, uh, case study submissions of not more than 20 pages should be provided by those who are the immediate parties to the particular case study no later than 4pm on Friday 13, July 18. That is to say, as in past rounds, <laughs> uh, case study submissions seven days hence. Submissions of not more than 30 pages in relation to the general questions posed in the course of the final address may be made by any party having leave to appear in this round of hearings no later than 4pm Monday 16 July. So case study submissions Friday next, general submissions Monday week, Monday 16 July. And as I said at the end of the last round of hearings, it is my expectation that documents that a party refers to in its written submissions will be restricted to those documents that have been tendered in the course of the hearings. If a party seeks to refer to a document that was not tendered, that party would need to apply to tender the document and would need to provide written submissions as to why the document was not tendered during the course of hearings. If such an application were made and granted and the document was tendered, it would be marked uh, as an exhibit and it would then be published in the ordinary way as uh, are all the exhibits that are received in the uh, uh, course of the hearings. Now, uh, that being so, I think uh, we adjourn the Commission to, is it 6 August? 6 August next in Melbourne.